R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 3, Chapters 1 through 7. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 1 The Might Have Beans of Chancellorsville. It is a terrible loss, Lee wrote Custis in the first shock of Jackson's death. So deep and personal was his grief that when he talked of him with General W. N. Pendleton, days afterward, he wept unabashed. Great and good were the adjectives he used, again and again, in speaking of the dead Stonewall. To one officer he said, I had such implicit confidence in Jackson's skill and energy that I never troubled myself to give him detailed instructions. The most general suggestions were all that he needed. For the remainder of his life, his references to Jackson always had a tone of affectionate warmth, and in his official report of Chancellorsville, he praised him with the superlatives he was wont to reserve for the men in the ranks alone, the movement by which the enemy's position was turned and the fortune of the day decided was conducted by the lamented Lieutenant General Jackson. I do not propose here to speak of the character of this illustrious man, since removed from the scene of his eminent usefulness by the hand of an inscrutable but all-wise providence. I nevertheless desire to pay the tribute of my admiration to the matchless energy and skill that marked the last act of his life, forming, as it did, a worthy conclusion of that long series of splendid achievements which won for him the lasting love and gratitude of his country. In the spirit of this encomium, he steadfastly viewed the death of his greatest lieutenant as the act of heaven. Any victory would be dear at such a price, he said, adding quickly, but God's will be done. To his brother Charles Carter Lee he wrote, I am grateful to Almighty God for having given us such a man. He looked to that same God to raise up someone in Jackson's stead, while he sought to save the morale of the army, and especially that of the Second Corps, from impairment because of the loss of the man whose body was sorrowfully borne to Richmond and thence to Lexington. In his general order announcing the passing of Stonewall, he said, the daring, skill and energy of this great and good soldier, by the decree of an all-wise providence, are now lost to us. But while we mourn his death, we feel that his spirit still lives, and will inspire the whole army with his indomitable courage and unshaken confidence in God as our hope and our strength. Let his name be a watchword to his corps, who have followed him to victory on so many fields. Let officers and men emulate his invincible determination to do everything in the defense of our beloved country. Jackson's example, he said in the letter to Charles Carter Lee, is left us, and Jackson's spirit I trust will be diffused over the whole Confederacy. To Hood, he wrote, we must all do more than formerly. We must endeavor to follow the unselfish, devoted, intrepid course he pursued, and we shall be strengthened rather than weakened by his loss. This was the utterance of a humble spirit. Lee never dreamed of claiming what military critics have since been disposed to assert that Chancellorsville was perhaps more nearly a flawless battle, from the Confederate point of view, than any that was ever planned and executed by an American commander. Facing an army two and a half times as large as his own, better equipped in every way and supplied with more numerous artillery, Lee had been on the defensive at the opening of the operation and had been threatened in front and on the left flank by a well-planned and admirably executed advance. In the face of his opponent's superiority, Lee divided his army, wrested the initiative from Hooker, again divided his force and overwhelmed the XI Corps. On the 3D he drove the enemy back to the lines, and on the 4th, the least successful day of the operations, he forced Sedgwick to retreat. He took a great risk in leaving so small a force at Fredericksburg and he seemingly took still longer chances on May 2nd when he detached Jackson and faced Hooker with only two divisions, but except for the capture of the Fredericksburg Heights on the 3D, the situation was entirely in his hands after May 1st. In a week's fighting, and through the campaign made possible by the successes of that week, he so changed the military situation that the Army of the Potomac did not undertake a march on Richmond for precisely one year. It was undoubtedly the most remarkable victory he ever achieved and it increased greatly his well-established reputation both in the eyes of the enemy and of the South. Lee did not make a single serious mistake in judging the plans of the enemy or in parcelling out his forces to checkmate Hooker. Almost alone among the Confederate commanders, he insisted from the first that the main attack was to be delivered on the left, and though he could not leave sufficient men under Early at Fredericksburg to prevent the capture of the heights, he at least protected himself against surprise from that quarter.
His handling of Anderson and McClaws on May 3 was tactically as excellent as his general plan was brilliant. If any criticism is to be made of the operations that Lee could personally control, it was that he failed to organize the attack earlier on May 4 at Salem Church, when he had Sedgwick almost surrounded on three sides by the columns of McClaws, Anderson, and Early. A battle on so extended a front was, as Alexander justly said, an all-day undertaking, but the signal was not given until 6 p.m. It was another instance where Lee seemed temperamentally unable to hasten a slow lieutenant, in this case, McClaws. The claim that Lee should have brought Anderson to the vicinity of Salem Church during the night of May 3, though advanced by competent authority, is, once again, the Council of Perfection. On the evening of the 3D, when he had been compelled to send off McClaws to cope with Sedgwick, Lee could reasonably assume that after having beaten the enemy that day, he could drive him on the morrow with four divisions, but it was asking too much even of him to demand that he attack Hooker with only three divisions. It was not until he saw how the federal positions had been strengthened on the night of the 3D 4th that he reasoned he must reconcentrate his whole army by disposing of Sedgwick entirely before he could hope to carry the fortified federal line. Then, but not until then, was he justified in assuming the defensive for one day with a force further reduced. He cannot fairly be condemned for failing to detach nearly two-fifths of his troops on the night of the 3D in the face of the main federal army, so long as there was a chance that he could follow up the victory of that day and drive Hooker into the Rappahannock on the morrow. Little has been written, but much might be said, of Lee's bold action in refusing to detach Stuart for pursuit of Stoneman's 10,000 cavalry. In this, Lee applied the lessons he had learned on the way to Second Manassas and on the march from South Mountain to Hagerstown and back again. He would not again willingly be blinded by the absence of his mounted forces, least of all in a country where observation was as difficult as in the wilderness. Deliberately he risked his communications in order to have the main body of his cavalry with him. How well that cavalry served him and how, in particular, Fitzley contributed to Jackson's march around the federal right flank is a notable part of the history of the campaign. It is hard to conceive how the flanking operation could have been undertaken with the same speed or with like assurance had Stuart been galloping across Midland, Virginia in pursuit of Stoneman. The contrast between what Lee knew and could do at Chancellorsville when Stuart was present, as compared with his groping through Pennsylvania when Stuart was absent two months later, is proof enough of the wisdom of his course. Hooker, on the other hand, was handicapped from the outset by his lack of cavalry. With an adequate force covering the federal right, Jackson's movement on May 2 would have been a failure, if, indeed, Lee would have had the temerity to undertake it. Chancellorsville saw a definite decline in the strength of the Confederate horse, but witnessed a notable increase of skill in its employment. Remarkable as was the victory, it was bought at an excessively great cost. The toll of general officers was very heavy. Four brigades lost eight success commanding officers. Total Confederate casualties numbered 13,156, of whom 1683 were killed, 9277 were wounded, and 2,196 were prisoners of war. These losses, Lee told the President on May 7, reflected the difference in the strength of the opposing armies. The killed and wounded, he explained, were always in proportion to the inequality of forces engaged. Hooker's losses, then of course unknown to Lee, reached 16,845, a far smaller percentage of his total strength. The disparity of numbers to which Lee attributed his heavier casualties were due, in part, to the absence of Pickett's and Hood's divisions of Longstreet's corps. That fact raises a question which goes deeper than the strategy of the field, had all Longstreet's corps been present, would Sedgwick have been destroyed? Could Hooker have been trapped in the gloomy woods before he had time to extricate himself and recross the Rappahannock? Prima facie, if the 62,500 that Lee commanded during the operations were able to win so stunning a success, it is reasonable to assume that the addition of 12,000 fine veterans would have magnified his victory. Consequently, in any fair appraisal of Lee's generalship, the question becomes one of whether Lee erred in permitting Longstreet to remain in Southside Virginia to collect supplies when his bayonets were so badly needed on the Rappahannock. The reasons that prompted Lee to trust Longstreet's discretion and not to demand his early return to the Rappahannock have already been given. The army needed provisions. If it were to assume the offensive, it had to accumulate a reserve.
If this could be done in no other way than by employing two crack divisions as commissary troops, then, up to a certain point, the work was worth doing. But time was pressing. Lee had set May 1 as the date beyond which one army or the other could not defer an offensive, yet it was not until April 27 that he inquired how soon Longstreet could rejoin. Longstreet, to be sure, was slow in collecting the supplies and failed to take advantage of his opportunities of meeting the Federals on even terms. His stay in Southside Virginia did no credit to him. Even in his military autobiography, which certainly did not understate his achievements, he was quite content to dismiss his expedition with a few anecdotes. Longstreet's slowness, however, does not exculpate Lee. Essentially a field commander, Lee was not successful in directing operations at a distance from him, except when dealing with Jackson. In the case of Longstreet's expedition, as in several other instances, he was too much disposed to trust the discretion of an absent lieutenant. A careful reading of the correspondence between him and Longstreet raises the suspicion that he permitted Longstreet to browbeat him. He took all the risk on his own front while Longstreet did nothing to justify the detachment of 12,000 of the best men in the army. Lee cannot be excused for this. His yielding to Longstreet on August 29, 1862, may have limited the success attained at the Second Battle of Manassas, and like compliance certainly was a factor in preventing a victory at Gettysburg, but it is possible that Lee's acceptance of Longstreet's unsoldierly excuses in March and April, 1863, cost him and the South still more dearly. Lee himself expressed to Hood his belief that if his whole army had been with him at Chancellorsville, Hooker would have been demolished. He might have said more. Had Longstreet reached him in time for him to assume the offensive before Hooker seized the initiative, the result might have been a swift march northward and a Gettysburg fought in May instead of July, with the added leadership of Jackson and with the strength of the men who fell at Chancellorsville. Failure to recall Longstreet earlier must, therefore, be written down as the darkest might have been of the Chancellorsville campaign and as one of the great mistakes of Lee's military career. The public, not foreseeing the consequences, did not think so. The few who had any inkling of the facts were disposed to blame the War Department rather than Lee. Precisely two years had elapsed since Lee had taken the decisive step in mobilizing the Virginia Volunteers. Two years of desperate contest, lacking one month, lay ahead of him. He was thus midway his military career as a Confederate commander when Jackson died. Much he had learned of the organization and administration of an army, much of conciliating rivals, much of arousing the best in men, much in creating the morale of victory. In the hard school of combat, he had mastered the art of the offensive so fully, both in strategy and in tactics, that little seemed left for him to acquire. But his military education was not yet completed. On a hill near a little town in Pennsylvania, the bell of a quiet seminary was calling him again to school to learn a new lesson, written red in blood. Chapter 2 The Reorganization That Explains Gettysburg Who is to lead Jackson's corps and to act in his stead? I know not how to replace him, Lee confessed to his wife. Among the infantry officers of the Army of Northern Virginia there were only four men whom he seems to have considered for corps command, A. P. Hill, R. S. Ewell, R. H. Anderson, and John B. Hood. Of these four, Lee regarded A. P. Hill as the best division commander he had, and from the time of the Maryland expedition had placed him next in line for a corps. Among the officers who had led Jackson's foot cavalry from Front Royal to the Potomac and back again to triumph at Port Republic and at Cross Keys, the man who had been closest to Jackson in those operations had been Major General R. S. Ewell, now able for the first time to walk after having lost a leg at Groveton. There was strong sentiment for his appointment as the logical successor of Jackson. Dick Ewell, as he was universally called, was then 46. After his graduation from West Point, he had served with cavalry until 1861. He always insisted that in fighting Indians on the plains he had learned all about commanding 50 United States dragoons and forgotten everything else. Odd in appearance and in speech, he was quick-tempered but generous and kindly and notoriously profane until he underwent a change of heart during the war. Professing to have some strange malady, he slept most irregularly and subsisted on a peculiar diet of wheat.
An excellent tactician and a rapid marcher, he was fond of personal participation in battle, and more than once, during the Valley Campaign, he had temporarily turned over the command to a subordinate in the absence of Jackson, had gone among the skirmishers, had satisfied his appetite for a fight, and then had returned with the fervent hope that old Jackson would not catch him. His temperamental fondness for desperate adventures had made him an ideal lieutenant to Jackson, whom he much admired but early suspected of being insane. After he had once heard Jackson seriously assert that he never took pepper with his food because it made his left leg weak, Ewell had been satisfied that Stonewall was mad. He had confided to one of his friends that he never saw one of Jackson's couriers approach without expecting an order to assault the North Pole. His soldiers idolized him, despite his hard marching, which seems to have been based on his professed maxim that the road to glory cannot be followed with much baggage. We can get along without everything but food and ammunition. Few jokes in the army were more cherished than that of Ewell's insistence during the winter of 1861-1862 that he could find food where his commissaries affirmed that the country had been swept clear. He went off on a foraging expedition and subsequently returned with one lean cow of leathery flanks. When asked how far this would go in feeding the army, he was nonplussed and admitted that he had forgotten he was heading a brigade. He was thinking in terms of his fifty dragoons on the prairie. As for R. H. Anderson and John B. Hood, Lee regarded both as capital officers who were improving in the field, though neither had so great reputation as either A. P. Hill or Ewell. Lee believed they would make good chiefs of corps, if it was necessary to use them, but he did not prefer either of them to their seniors. Outside the infantry then with the Army of Northern Virginia, only two other men could reasonably have been considered at the time. One was D. H. Hill and the other was Jeb Stuart. D. H. Hill was a most tenacious fighter. Few division commanders could get more from a given number of men. That had been demonstrated at South Mountain and at Sharpsburg. But the North Carolinian was critical and outspoken and not the type of lieutenant with whom Lee worked most satisfactorily. Besides, he was in command in North Carolina, where the civil authorities imposed in him a measure of confidence that made them willing to trust him with fewer troops than they would have demanded for defense under almost anyone else. Hill, moreover, was in an odd state of mind at the time, insisting on explicit orders and asking that the district commanders under him report directly to the War Department. Stuart was held by some to have exhibited qualities on May 3 that marked him as the best man in the army to be retained permanently in the command he had assumed on the night of May 2, after both Jackson and A. P. Hill had been wounded. There is a hint in one of Lee's dispatches indicating that Stuart thought Lee had not been satisfied with his handling of the infantry that day because Lee had not publicly commended him, but as Stuart recommended someone else for succession to Jackson's corps, it is hardly probable that he regarded himself as in line of promotion for that post. So far as the evidence shows, Lee did not consider him. This doubtless was because he regarded Stuart as indispensable where he was. Neither Wade Hampton nor Fitz Lee, who were the senior brigadiers in the cavalry, had then shown much of Stuart's extraordinary skill in intelligence service, which was perhaps his most useful contribution to the Army of Northern Virginia. Even had they been ready for promotion, it is hardly probable that Lee would have considered them. He would never willingly have supplanted Stuart, because he believed a general of infantry could more nearly take Jackson's place at the head of the Second Corps than anyone else could perform for the army the service that Stuart was rendering. It must, however, remain a tantalizing subject of speculation what the result would have been if Lee's choice had fallen on Stuart, for Stuart would have fought furiously at Gettysburg, and no new commander of the cavalry would have ventured on the raid that deprived Lee of part of his cavalry during that campaign. A. P. Hill, Ewell, Anderson, Hood, D. H. Hill, Stewart, the choice narrowed down to A. P. Hill and Ewell. In reality, it was hardly a choice, because Lee had long considered the Corps too large to be handled by one man in the tangled country through which the army operated. He had long desired to increase the number of Corps and would have done so earlier had he been able to decide upon suitable commanders. He determined now to make the best of the dark necessity and to reorganize the army into three corps. Longstreet, of course, was to remain at the head of the first corps, to Ewell, as Jackson's lieutenant, the second corps was to be entrusted, and for A. P. Hill a third corps was to be created. On May 20, Lee submitted the proposal to the president and commended Hill and Ewell to his consideration.
In its consequences, this was one of the most important resolves of Lee's military career. At the most critical hour of its history, it placed two-thirds of the army under new corps leaders. A. P. Hill had never commanded more than one division in action, except for the confused hour after Jackson had been struck down. Hill, however, was devoted, prompt, and energetic, and, though both Longstreet and Jackson had put him under arrest, he deserved promotion. If he did not thereafter display even a spark of the genius of Jackson, he never was guilty of any irremediable blunder. With Ewell, the circumstances of promotion were unusual. Lee took him at the valuation of others, rather than on his own knowledge of the soldier. The selection was sentimental and therefore inevitable. Ewell had served directly under Lee only for the period from June 26 to July 13, and from August 15 to August 25, 1862, in all, something less than a month, and then always subject to Jackson's guidance. Lee esteemed him as an honest, brave soldier who had always done his duty well, but he did not know the full extent of the physical disability resulting from Ewell's loss of a leg, and still less did he know the working of a mind to which he was entrusting the lives of more than 20,000 men. Some of those who had served with Ewell in the valley were aware that he would not initiate a plan if he could possibly subject it in advance to the criticism of others. Lee had never had an opportunity of discovering this lack of self-confidence in Ewell, nor was he aware that Ewell's experience with Jackson had schooled him to obey the letter of orders and not to exercise discretion. This had made him a better rather than a worse commander under Jackson, whose army of the valley had been small enough for Stonewall to keep all its operations under his eye, but it was to prove a heavy handicap to Lee, who had become accustomed to march with Longstreet and to leave Jackson to use his own sound judgment in handling the other corps. Lee did not realize how difficult it would be for a man of Ewell's temperament to adjust himself quickly to a system of command that usually placed an immensely greater responsibility on Lee's principal lieutenants than Jackson had even entrusted to his subordinates. Gettysburg was to show the results of a P. Hill's inexperience and of Ewell's indecision in the face of discretionary orders. The promotion of A. P. Hill and of Ewell being promptly authorized by Mr. Davis, Lee decided to apportion his troops equitably among the three corps he proposed to set up. The army consisted at the time of eight divisions, including the two of Longstreet's that had been sent to Southside, Virginia. Jackson had commanded four A. P. Hills, D. H. Hills, Early's, and Trimble's, the last led at Chancellorsville by Colston. Longstreet had McClaws's, Pickett's, Hood's, and R. H. Anderson's. To rearrange these two in three corps of three divisions each, Lee had to take one division from Longstreet and one from Jackson's old corps, and had to form a new ninth division. He decided to transfer Anderson from Longstreet and A. P. Hill's former division from the second corps and to give these two to A. P. Hill for his new third corps. As A. P. Hill's division had consisted of six brigades, Lee separated two of these from their former comrades. He made up the 9th Division with these two and with the brigades of Pettigrew and Davis, which he received from North Carolina in return for brigades he had previously detached. Lee, it will be recalled, had already promoted Rhodes to D. H. Hill's old division, and Edward Johnson he had assigned to the division formerly commanded by Trimble. Colston, temporary commander of that division at Chancellorsville, he now relieved. This arrangement necessitated the selection of two new division commanders, one to succeed A. P. Hill and the other for the new division. After some rather confused correspondence with the War Department and the President, during which Mr. Davis became irritated, Lee named Harry Haight for one of Hill's divisions and W. D. Pender of North Carolina for the other. Numerous promotions to succeed brigadier generals killed or disabled at Chancellorsville or found incompetent had likewise to be made. The result was an almost complete reorganization of the army, as follows. The First Corps was reduced to three divisions, McClaws's, Pickett's, and Hood's, in none of which there was any change. The Second Corps, now Ewell's, included Early's, Johnson's, and Rhodes's divisions. The four brigades of Early were unchanged. Johnson's division was under a commander who had served a very short time with Jackson and had never been with Lee except for some minor cooperation in the West Virginia Campaign of 1861. Three of the four major units of this division were under new brigadier commanders, George H. Stewart, James A. Walker, and John M. Jones, and the fourth, Nichols's, continued under its senior colonel because Lee was unable to find a man to succeed Nichols.
Here, then, was a different, a revolutionized command for the famous old division that included the Stonewall Brigade. It was hardly surprising that all the field officers of that brigade tendered their resignations. The 3rd Division of the 2nd Corps, under Rhodes, contained one new brigade that had never fought with the Army of Northern Virginia. One of the other brigades was led by a colonel. Taken as a whole, the 2nd Corps, as reconstituted, was a difficult command for any man and especially for one like Ewell, who had been absent from the Army of Northern Virginia for nine months. The 3rd Corps, that of A. P. Hill, comprised Anderson's, Haight's, and Pender's divisions. That of Anderson was in good hands, and its command had not materially changed. But Haight's division was led by a soldier who had joined the Army of Northern Virginia only in February. Two of the four brigades of this division were strangers to the Army. The 3rd Division of the 3rd Corps, Penders, had a new commander, and one of its brigades was under an officer who had just been promoted. While this reorganization of the infantry was in progress, the battalion formation of the artillery was perfected, and the general reserve artillery was divided among the three corps. The officers remained much the same, though there were numerous promotions. The battery personnel was not changed, but new contacts had to be formed with unfamiliar divisional chiefs. There was, inevitably, a temporary lack of complete coordination with the infantry. Weakened by the hard winter, the cavalry, too, had to be enlarged. With the patriotic cooperation of Major General Samuel Jones, commanding in southwest Virginia, Lee procured from that quarter a new and large brigade of horse under Brigadier General A. G. Jenkins, but neither this officer nor his men were accustomed to the type of cavalry fighting in which the rest of Stuart's command was experienced. Another cavalry brigade was also brought from Western Virginia under Brigadier General John B. Imboden. This officer had been on a regular, detached duty, and many of his men had recently been recruited, some of them from the infantry service. In short, the reorganization affected all three arms of the service. It involved the admixture of new units with old, it broke up many associations of long standing, and it placed the veteran regiments of a large part of the army under men who were unacquainted with the soldiers and with the methods of General Lee. The same magnificent infantry were ready to obey Lee's orders, but many of their superior officers were untried and were nervous under new responsibilities. Even in Longstreet's Corps, which remained intact except for the transfer of Anderson's division to Hill's Third Corps, there was a difference, little observed, perhaps, but exceedingly ominous. Where other troops had undergone a change in the personnel of their commanders, the First Corps was to discover that it had suffered an unhappy change in the outlook of its leader. Longstreet's service in Southside Virginia had been inconspicuous, if not discreditable, but it had given him a taste of independent command and had greatly increased his opinion of himself as a strategist. On his way back to the army, which he rejoined on May 9, he had stopped in Richmond and had been much flattered by an interview with the Secretary of War, who had asked his advice on the unpromising situation at Vicksburg. Longstreet had proposed that he take two divisions of his corps, reinforce the army under Bragg, and take the offensive against Rosecrans. The secretary had not approved the plan, but Longstreet had returned to the army, secretly swollen with the idea that he was the man to redeem the falling fortunes of the Confederacy. Jackson's death increased this feeling of self-importance. The grave of Stonewall had eclipsed Longstreet in public opinion and had held first place in the esteem of Lee, careful though Lee was never to show favoritism. Now that Jackson was no more, Longstreet seemed to feel that it was his prerogative to devise as well as to execute, to dictate the strategy as well as to direct the tactics, to be the commander's commander and to guide his errant faculties by his superior military judgment. Nothing quite suited him, least of all the appointment of two Virginians to the rank he held. D. H. Hill or McClaws, he grumbled to himself, would have been better than either Ewell or A. P. Hill, but neither was of Lee's own state and consequently both were passed over. Two untried corps commanders, three of the nine divisions under new leaders, seven freshly promoted brigadier generals of infantry, six infantry brigades under their senior colonels, a third of the cavalry directed by officers who had not previously served with the Army of Northern Virginia, the artillery redistributed, the most experienced of the corps commanders inflated with self-importance, above all, Jackson's discipline, daring, and speed lost forever to the Army, such was Lee's plight. When the establishment of the new corps was formally announced on May 30, though the reorganization was not then complete, 
To explain this reorganization is largely to explain Gettysburg. Nothing happened on that field that could not be read in the roster of the army, the peculiarities and inexperience of the new leaders, the distribution of the units, and the inevitable confusion of a staff that had to be enlarged or extemporized to direct troops with which it was unacquainted. But for the larger experience of the men in the ranks and the broader knowledge of war acquired by Lee and some of the other leaders, the army was back where it was at the beginning of the Seven Days Battles. If the next general engagement came quickly, it would certainly be the Gaines's Mill of the second period of the war in Virginia. Full coordination would be almost impossible. Lee had made what he considered to be the best selections from the officers available and he realized some if not all of the risks he took in subjecting the reorganized army to the early test of a great battle on alien soil. Even had he been wholly conscious of the danger he faced, the option of delay for the training of his new subordinates was denied him. Was he to upset the enemy's plans for the summer campaign and force him to relax the tightening grip of Grant on Vicksburg? Then he must strike quickly. Perhaps his state of mind was most fully disclosed in a few sentences of a letter he wrote Hood while the reorganization was underway. I agree with you, he said, in believing that our army would be invincible if it could be properly organized and officered. There never were such men in an army before. They will go anywhere and do anything if properly led. But there is the difficulty, proper commanders, where can they be obtained? But they are improving, constantly improving. Rome was not built in a day, nor can we expect miracles in our favor. There it is, absolute confidence in the men who shivered and sweltered, endured hunger and tramped cheerfully over hard roads on bare feet, lay wounded and uncomplaining or, like Stoics, faced death on strange fields, absolute faith in the ranks, and consciousness of the limitations of the command, but, along with that, the patience and the hope of an intrepid soul. Chapter 3 The Army Starts Northward Again while Lee was reorganizing the Army of Northern Virginia after the death of Jackson, he could not forget the enemy across the river or the federal forces that were gathering in ominous strength on other fronts. During the two weeks following the Battle of Chancellorsville, Hooker made a few moves of no consequences, but he seemed to be receiving reinforcements as if the Washington government were determined to utilize his army for the major eastern offensive of the year. Around Vicksburg, the front of the Federals was slowly advancing, while General Joseph E. Johnston seemed powerless to divert Grant. In Tennessee, Rosecrans was defying Bragg. In North Carolina, a force appeared to be preparing for another drive against the railroads, and from Hampton Roads a small army was threatening the lower end of the peninsula of Virginia. In what manner could the dwindling Confederate armies best be employed against the hosts that were concentrating as if to cut the South into bits that could be devoured at leisure? Longstreet maintained that Bragg should be strengthened to club Rosecrans, Secretary Seddon favored the dispatch of two of Longstreet's divisions to the Mississippi, Lee explained that, in his opinion, the Confederacy had to choose between maintaining the line of the Mississippi and that of Virginia. If he could procure sufficient troops and could draw General Hooker away from the Rappahannock, he proposed to assume the offensive and to enter Pennsylvania. He believed that the best offensive for Richmond was at a distance from it, he did not think it desirable to fight again on the Rappahannock, where he could not follow up his victory. Neither did he wish once more to carry his army into the ravaged counties near Washington. A defeated foe could easily retire within the defenses of that city, as Pope had done. Even had Lee been willing to give battle in Virginia, he did not think he could subsist his troops there, whereas, if he marched into Pennsylvania he would find provisions in abundance. By crossing high up the Potomac he could move into the rich Cumberland Valley, draw the enemy after him, clear Virginia of Federals, break up their plan of operations for the summer, and perhaps force the enemy to recall the forces that were troubling the South Atlantic coasts and threatening the railroads. Contact with the realities of war, moreover, might increase in the North the peace movement, which seemed to be gathering strength. It would be folly, he said subsequently, to have divided my army, the armies of the enemy were too far apart for me to attempt to fall upon them in detail. I considered the problem in every possible phase, and to my mind, it resolved itself into a choice of one of two things either to retire to Richmond and stand a siege, which must ultimately have ended in surrender, or to invade Pennsylvania. Of all the arguments that weighed with him, the most decisive single one was that he could no longer feed his army on the Rappahannock. He had to invade the North for provisions, regardless of all else. 
While he was developing this plan, he was summoned to Richmond for conference. He spent May 1417 there and reviewed the military situation with the President, the Secretary of War, and the Cabinet. Davis was much troubled at the time by calls for troops at Vicksburg and sought the advice of Lee, who urged that Johnston attack Grant promptly, but when it came to a final choice between advancing into Pennsylvania or detaching troops from Lee to do battle on the Mississippi, the President and all members of the Cabinet except Postmaster General Reagan favored a new invasion of the North. Back on May 18 at his old headquarters near Hamilton's Crossing, Lee began to develop the details of his new adventure. He met with opposition from one man only, Longstreet. The commander of the First Corps was still enamored of his own theory that the proper course was to reinforce Bragg and attack Rosecrans. It is impossible to say how far his ambition influenced his proposal or to what extent his plan stirred his ambition. Perhaps he dreamed of supplanting Bragg and of winning the decisive victory. In any case, he held with tenacity to his opinion and argued for it stubbornly. Lee heard him, as always, with patience, but did not see how any good could possibly result from dividing the Army of Northern Virginia, perhaps for months, in the face of the enemy. The Confederacy was witnessing around Vicksburg at the time an example of the impotence that followed a dispersal of force. Finding that his own plan had no chance of adoption, Longstreet unwillingly yielded, but insisted that if a campaign was to be undertaken in Pennsylvania, it should be offensive in strategy but defensive in tactics. If Lee would move into Pennsylvania and not attack the enemy, but attempt to force Hooker to give battle, Longstreet conceded that the results might justify the venture. He even assured General Lee that the First Corps would receive and defend the battle if he would guard its flanks, leaving his other corps to gather the fruits of victory. The event was to show that it would have been better if Lee had stood Longstreet before him and had bluntly reminded him that he and not the chief of the First Corps commanded the Army of Northern Virginia. Had he done so, he either would have had a different lieutenant general in the fateful days of July, or else his senior lieutenant would have been in a different state of mind. Apparently, however, it never occurred to Lee that Longstreet was trying to dictate. So little was such an idea in his mind that when Swinton affirmed, some years later, in his campaigns of the Army of the Potomac, that Longstreet had told him Lee had promised to maintain a tactical defensive in Pennsylvania, Lee refused to believe that Longstreet had ever made a statement to that effect. The idea, he told Colonel William Allen, was absurd. Lee never made any such promise and never thought of doing any such thing. At the time, moreover, he promptly rejected a proposal that Sutton conveniently put forward, without any knowledge of the discussion at headquarters, for placing Longstreet in command between the James and Cape Fear. The services of General Longstreet, Lee said simply, will be required with this army. Longstreet in his vanity mistook Lee's tact and politeness for acquiescence in his plans and went about his preparations for the move in the proud belief that he had carried his point and that the campaign was to be conducted in accordance with his ideas. It was characteristic of him to be energetic and enthusiastic when he approved the course of his commanding general, but to be apathetic and full of misgivings when his superior acted contrary to his views. This graceless quality was stronger than ever during the months immediately following Jackson's death when he magnified his own office. He had nobody but himself to blame for misinterpreting politeness as compliance. Yet the episode is a warning to students of war that tact is sometimes dangerous in dealing with self-assertive subordinates. Unaware that there was any menace to the cause in the mind of Longstreet, Lee's misgivings were not of him, but of the safety of Richmond, the strength of the army, and the possibility of maneuvering Hooker out of his strategic position on Stafford Heights. A federal force reported to number 5,000 had gone to West Point at the head of York River, 37 miles from Richmond. Troops of unreported roster were still in the vicinity of Suffolk. Lee was satisfied that an offensive across the Potomac would impel President Lincoln to abandon any plan for a general forward movement from the coast, but he considered it likely that a dash might be made on Richmond, and he could not afford to leave it defenseless, though he was most anxious to recall to the army the brigades that had from time to time been detached from his army and sent southward. How could he protect Richmond and at the same time make his army large enough for a distant offensive? Gathering sufficient strength for the offensive was a matter of provisions, of horses, and of additional men, not a question of morale, for the victory at Chancellorsville had raised the spirit of the army to the highest pitch.
As for food, Longstreet's activities in eastern North Carolina had not resulted in the accumulation of any surplus at the advanced base. Whatever had been collected in the North State during the spring had disappeared in the commissary warehouses. However, raids into Transmontane, Virginia had yielded a goodly stock of cattle. Lee planned to requisition some of this from General Samuel Jones just before he moved, and he reasoned that if he could drive beef on the hoof with him until he reached Pennsylvania, he would find abundance of everything there. Little could be done in procuring horses from the south. The animals with the army were in a slightly better condition now that grass was springing, but they were still thin. They looked much as they had during the Chancellorsville operation when a federal officer had said that they and the wagons were like a congregation of all the crippled Chicago emigrant trains that ever escaped off the desert. There was nothing to do but to use these mournful beasts until they could be recruited by the sleek horses enjoying the lush grass of the fat Cumberland Valley. The reinforcement of the cavalry with Jenkins's and Imboden's brigades was underway. When the army moved into the valley and the Federals were cleared out, Jones's brigade, which was still serving there, would be available, also. The mounted troops would then number seven brigades, enough to cover the advance, if properly disposed. Any material increase in the infantry, though it seemed imperative, was almost a forlorn hope. Hood was returning with his full division and Pickett was at Hanover Junction with three of his four brigades, but all Lee's powers of persuasion had not sufficed to prevail upon President Davis to release the 4th Brigade of Pickett or the three brigades that had been sent southward during the previous winter. Unless he could procure them at the last moment, he would not have for the campaign as many as 75,000 officers and men of all arms, about 60,000 infantry, 4,700 artillery and 10,200 cavalry. Except for the cavalry recruits, most of these troops were tried veterans of Chancellorsville and of the campaign of 1862, men who had never failed Lee. As he reviewed some of them toward the end of May his confidence in them was greater than ever. The fact is, to quote Harry Haight, General Lee believed that the Army of Northern Virginia, as it then existed, could accomplish anything. If the detached brigades were returned, Lee was willing to trust the army for its part in the great gamble of a second invasion of the North, even though the odds against it were dangerously long. But how could he recover those absent brigades so long as Richmond seemed to be threatened by raiders? The final difficulty in the way of an advance, that of maneuvering around the federal right flank and wresting the initiative from Hooker, could only be measured by the attempt. There was, however, the risk that Hooker might anticipate Lee and either move his army from Acquia Creek to James River by water, or cross the Rappahannock and offer battle before Lee could start, or else throw his bridges and start an advance on Richmond as soon as Lee weakened his forces at Fredericksburg. The gossip in the camps was that Lee had said he believed he would swap Queens, Washington for Richmond, but he never hoped to capture Washington and he never intended to expose Richmond if he could prevent it. He was not sure what his adversary was planning to do and he could not find out. For it no longer was as easy a matter for Lee's spies to penetrate the federal lines as it had been under the lax administration of Burnside. Whatever else Hooker had failed to do, and however much he had disappointed the expectations of the North, he had reorganized his outposts and had placed an almost impenetrable screen around his army. For the first time on Virginia soil, thanks to the improvement in the Union cavalry and in the intelligence service of the Army of the Potomac, the Federals knew more of what was happening on the south side of the Rappahannock than they knew of what was taking place north of the river. In the face of these uncertainties, the safety of Richmond, the return of detached units, and the possibility of a sudden move by Hooker, Lee had to prepare for the defensive while hoping to be able to take the offensive. On May 11, Stuart had been ordered into Culpeper to observe the enemy. On the 19th, as soon as Lee had returned from Richmond, the artillery had been put on the alert. The next day Pickett had been ordered to prepare to march to the front when called. By the 23 D. Lee was satisfied that Hooker was making ready for another move. Stuart was directed to concentrate and await developments. For days later, there were indications of a decline in the strength of the federal forces in front of Fredericksburg. This was taken to be a sign that Hooker was about to advance again by some of the fords on the upper Rappahannock. McClaws was accordingly instructed to have his troops in condition to cross the river in a counter-demonstration, and Hood, who had come up in rear of the Confederate left, was told to move to Verdiersville, close to the fords of the Rapidan. I wish I could get at those people over there, Lee said that day, as he looked wistfully across the river.
the apparent imminence of another battle on the south bank of the Rappahannock, where victory would be as barren as costly, made Lee more anxious than ever to launch his projected offensive in Pennsylvania. He was willing to take the other risks if he could be reasonably sure of the safety of Richmond and could recover his lost brigades. The difference between a hazardous defensive and a practicable offensive resolved itself into the difference between the strength he then mustered and the strength he could command if those brigades were returned to him. Yet it was so easy for Hooker to engage Lee while the forces at Suffolk and at West Point marched on Richmond. By May 30 Lee was almost persuaded that the time had passed when he could take the offensive, and as he was desirous of building up a force for the protection of the Richmond Front, he urged on the Secretary of War that troops be called to Richmond from the Carolina coast, that the fortifications be strengthened, and that local defense units be organized. Three anxious days passed at the end of May, with the troops disposed either to start a march up the Rappahannock or to meet Hooker if he crossed the river. Lee could not wholly forego hope of the offensive, even in the face of all the obstacles, but he had to admit to the president, if I am able to move, I propose, to, do so cautiously, watching the result, and not to get beyond recall until I find it safe. Then, unexpectedly, on the very day that this letter was written, June 2nd, there came a telegram from Richmond announcing that the troops previously at West Point, supported by a force from Gloucester and Yorktown, were marching northward. The destination of these Federals was not clear, but it was manifest that if they were moving away from that city no immediate advance on Richmond was contemplated. Lee saw in this his opportunity. Now, if ever, he must seize the initiative and forestall the offensive he believed Hooker was preparing. With Richmond no longer in serious danger, he could hope that the President would authorize him to call Pickett's division and Pettigrew's brigade from Hanover and start his maneuver around the federal flank in the hope that he might enter Pennsylvania. There was no certainty that the President would authorize the movement of the troops from Hanover Junction, but orders were forthwith issued by Lee for an advance by part of the army the very next day. Ewell was called to headquarters and given his instructions. Longstreet was present during the conference on Lee's invitation and promptly took the floor to argue his thesis of a strategic offensive and a tactical defensive. He insisted that if the army was to take the offensive at all, it should do so south of the Potomac, preferably in the vicinity of Culpeper Courthouse. Lee, as usual, seems to have let Longstreet present his view fully, with few remarks on his own part, but with no intention whatever of sanctioning another battle that could only exact a heavy toll of the Army of Northern Virginia on a field whence the Federals could easily withdraw to the Washington defenses. On the morning of June 3 the enemy showed no sign of attacking, and McClaws's division was set in motion up the Rappahannock for Culpeper. The march was conducted without any Federal demonstration. That night Haight's division of A. P. Hill's Corps relieved the pickets of Rhodes's division of Ewell's Corps, and on the morning of the 4th Rhodes started toward Culpeper. Still there was no activity on the Stafford Heights. Emboldened by this, Lee withdrew early and Johnson on the 5th and left only A. P. Hill on the Fredericksburg line. Scarcely had the last of Ewell's regiments wound their way over the hills than the Federals began to lay a pontoon bridge over the Rappahannock on the old site opposite Deep Run. It was done so ostentatiously as to raise suspicion from the first, but it was followed by a furious cannonade and then by the crossing of a small force of infantry. Lee reasoned that Hooker was either attempting to feel out the Confederate strength or else was attempting to divert attention from some move on his own part, but he deemed it prudent to halt Ewell's march in case Hooker should develop a general offensive, and he disposed Hill's forces to hold the line temporarily. On the 6th, the Federals not being strengthened, Lee became satisfied that Hill could cope with the troops in his front and he ordered Ewell to resume his advance. That afternoon, having delivered to Hill detailed instructions drawn up the preceding night, Lee broke up headquarters at Hamilton's Crossing, for the last time, as it proved, and took the road his men marched. Hill's orders were to resist the enemy, to conceal the movement of the army, to fall back down the line of the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad, if attacked in superior force, and to call up Pettigrew's brigade and Pickett's division from Hanover Courthouse if necessary. In case the Federals disappeared from his front, Hill was to cross the river and pursue. Had Lee made an orderly appraisal of the situation when he stopped by the roadside and bivouacked on that night of his new march toward the enemy's country, his chief causes of concern would have been the reorganization of the army and the brevity of the time that had elapsed since it had been effected. The process of selection and commission had been slow.
It had been only four days before the march began but the Second Corps had been formally set up under Ewell and the Third under A. P. Hill. The battalions of ordnance had not been allotted the Corps until June 2 and on the 4th the General Artillery Reserve had been broken up and the Corps Chiefs of Artillery assigned. The troops were the same magnificent fighting men, but the groupings, in large part, were new. Too many untried general officers were facing northward for the most difficult campaign the Army of Northern Virginia had ever undertaken. Granting that delay in launching the offensive was impossible, the risks involved in ordering the army into the enemy's country before the recently named commanders had accustomed themselves to handling large bodies of troops with their small staffs were immense and ominous. Chapter 4 – Maneuvering to Enter Pennsylvania Arriving on the morning of June 7 at Culpeper Courthouse, near which two of Longstreet's divisions and all three of Ewell's were encamped, Lee was more than ever convinced that his army must be reinforced if it was to execute successfully his plan of invasion. He telegraphed Davis a suggestion that a brigade from Richmond be moved to Hanover Junction to relieve Pickett, so that commander could bring Longstreet's 3rd Division forward. The brigade from Richmond could be replaced by one from the Suffolk Front, whence nearly all the Federals were said to have departed. Lee urged, also, in a letter to the President, that Beauregard's troops from Charleston, S.C. either be sent to reinforce Johnston in Mississippi or to unite with the Army of Northern Virginia. At the same time he ordered Imboden's cavalry, which had not yet joined Stuart, to organize a raid into northwest Virginia, and he instructed Brigadier General A. G. Jenkins to prepare his brigade of horse from southwest Virginia for cooperation in the Shenandoah Valley, whither he was hoping soon to be able to send a part of the army on the second stage of the proposed advance into Pennsylvania. The remainder of the cavalry, scattered around Culpeper, had been made ready by the drama-loving Stuart for a general review, which he asked Lee to witness the next day, June 8. The spirit of the son of a revolutionary cavalryman prompted Lee to agree. General Hood, also, was invited to witness the scene and to bring any of his people. He responded by marching on the field with his entire division. This was a little more than had been bargained for, but it was accepted in a spirit of hospitality. The only condition the hosts imposed on the Texans was that they were not to yell, here's your mule, which was deemed a special insult to cavalrymen who prided themselves on their steeds and on their ability to keep their saddles. If the infantry insisted on challenging appropriately the horsemanship of the troops, Wade Hampton laughingly threatened to charge them. Terms of peace and amity having been concluded between the two arms, the Texans spread themselves at ease in front of the cavalry, who had been drawn up in two lines on a vast field east of the town. At the appointed hour, Lee arrived with his staff and most of his general officers. Stuart, much bedizened, met the commanding general. Some of the young ladies of Culpeper had decorated Jeb's saddle with flowers and had put a wreath around the neck of his mount. Lee was much amused. Take care, General Stuart, he said banteringly. That is the way General Pope's horse was adorned when he went to the Battle of Manassas. Not long before, at a review of the Second Corps, Lee had ridden so fast that only eight Pete Hill and one member of his staff had remained at his side when he drew rein. Lee had enjoyed the experience, and now he put Traveller at the gallop, past the long front of the first line of gaunt cavalrymen. They were clad in tattered butternut or grey, but they made a gallant showing with their burnished sabres. Three miles Lee rode, by flags that bore the names of many battles. Then he turned and galloped three miles back along the second line without a pause. Many were the aching sides and panting steeds when at last he halted on a little eminence above which a large Confederate flag was flying on a high pole. Now it was the cavalryman's turn. Wheeling into column at the sound of the bugle, they galloped past at the charge, Stuart riding at their head with his blade at Tier's point. It was just the sort of scene devised in feudal times to make men forget the butchery of war and admiration of its pageantry, and it must have made Lee's heart beat faster, but it aroused only the contempt of some of Hood's footmen, who had no high opinion of the valor of cavalry. Wouldn't we clean em out, one of the Texans remarked, half wistfully, if old Hood would let us loose on em? As his climax, Stuart placed on a hillock nearly his famous horse artillery, the guns the dead Pelham loved so well, and then, while the pieces blazed away with the smoke and roar of blank cartridges, he led a sham charge against the batteries.
It was great fun to Jeb and to many of his men, but certainly not to the horses or to some of General Lee's guests, who, as the worthy Pendleton complained, had to sit on our horses in the dust half the day. Lee had been known to profess that he was only qualified to be a colonel of cavalry, or perhaps a brigadier if he had good subordinates, and he did not weary. It was a splendid sight, he wrote. The men and horses looked well. Stuart was in all his glory. But he was not too much occupied with the spectacle to notice that the trees of the Richmond saddles were very hard on the backs of the horses, and that the Richmond-made carbines were very inferior. He sought forthwith to correct them. Early the next morning, June 9, Lee received a hurried report from Stuart announcing that the enemy's cavalry, with some infantry, was pouring across Beverly and Kelly's fords, on both flanks of the Confederate outposts. Lee suspected that the move was simply a reconnaissance, and he wrote Stuart where he could get infantry in case he needed it, but urged him to conceal the presence of Confederate foot if it was possible for him to do so. Soon it became apparent that the Federal horse coming from the direction of Kelly's Ford had outwitted Stuart's troopers on that road and were moving to get on the flank and in the rear of Southern cavalry defending the approaches southward from Beverly Ford. Well it was, then, that Stuart had concentrated his men for the review the previous day, for he required every one of them. The action centered around Fleetwood Hill, a long ridge running with the meridian just north of Brandy Station on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, seven miles northeast of Culpeper Courthouse. Hour after hour, in charge and countercharge, the opposing cavalry contended for this high ground. Lee left the management of the field to Stuart and, of course, had no fear of a serious disaster, because he had sufficient infantry at hand to hurl the Federals back across the Rappahannock if the Confederate mounted troops were worsted, but in the afternoon, as this Battle of Brandy Station developed into the greatest cavalry engagement of the entire war, he ordered an infantry brigade to report to General Hampton, and he rode forward in person to survey the situation. As he approached the field Lee was shocked to meet his own son, Rooney, being born to the rear with a severe wound in the leg, received at 4.30 p.m. Fortunately, the wound was not considered mortal, and Rooney seemed much more concerned over those who had fallen in the fight than over his own condition. While Lee was doing what he could to make his son comfortable, the battle ended in a retreat of the Federals by the routes they had followed in their advance. It was by every count, as Lee's adjutant rode his sweetheart, a grand cavalry fight, and the result probably bore out that officer's estimate, altogether, our cavalry is justified in claiming an advantage, though neither side can be said to have gained a great deal. It was nearly an even fight. The Confederate losses were around 485, those of the Federals approximately 930. Lee did not regard this action as a serious threat to the continuance of his operations, but he had to contend with a more serious obstacle in the attitude of the administration. In dispatches from the War Department a new concern for the safety of Richmond was observable, together with an extreme reluctance to forward the troops he believed necessary for the adequate reinforcement of the army. This state of mind on the part of the administration had led him on the 8th to offer to return closer to Richmond if the government so desired, and it could not be ignored for the future. On the other hand, he could not escape the general logic of an offensive defensive nor overlook the strategic advantage he had already gained through the failure of the Federals to attack a P. Hill at Fredericksburg. As he read the northern newspapers with care, he was confirmed in his belief that the projected campaign in Pennsylvania would strengthen the arguments of the Northern Peace Party, which was already contending that the South could not be conquered by force, but might be won back to the Union by a generous peace. His resolution held, he would send one corps forward and await developments. If that corps did nothing more, it would at least clear Milroy from the valley and probably would force the Federals to abandon altogether the line of the Rappahannock. The plan of advance had been worked out before the vanguard had left Fredericksburg. It called for the cooperation of Jenkins's cavalry in preparing the way for a march to Winchester by Ewell, who had been selected for that task because he had a full corps of three divisions and also because he knew the country thoroughly. If Ewell was unmolested, he was to mask Winchester and was to continue over the Potomac, through Maryland and into Pennsylvania. Longstreet was then to advance northward on the eastern side of the Blue Ridge, so as to cover the advance of a P. Hill. When Hill was also in the valley, Longstreet was to follow him, and the cavalry were to hold the mountain gaps until the advance into Pennsylvania had called all the Federals north of the Potomac.
It was, of course, a bold plan, but in view of the nature of the terrain and the speed with which the movement could be made, it was no more dangerous than other maneuvers Lee had successfully executed. Had there been any strong demonstration on the morning of the 10th by the Federals across Beverly Ford, Lee would perhaps have deferred the start of Ewell, but as the enemy remained quietly in his camps, Lee let the order stand, and the reconstituted Second Corps started on its way. It was noticed that Ewell was in fine health and spirits and, despite his wooden leg, rode his horse as well as anyone need to. As Ewell's men turned westward toward the Blue Ridge, Lee sat down to write the president on the subject that had been so much in his mind during the days since Chancellorsville, the promotion of the peace movement in the North. A most important letter it was for two reasons. It showed Lee alive to the danger that the Southern cause would be lost because of the superiority of the federal resources. Similarly, it disclosed Lee's simple reasoning on politics, with which he had little acquaintance. He pointed out that the intransigent attitude of the Southern newspapers was discouraging those Northerners who were arguing that the South would return to the Union if the Washington government made peace. Then he said, Conceding to our enemies the superiority claimed by them in numbers, resources, and all the means and appliances for carrying on the war, we have no right to look for exemptions from the military consequences of a vigorous use of these advantages, excepting by such deliverance as the mercy of heaven may accord to the courage of our soldiers, the justice of our cause, and the constancy in prayers of our people. While making the most we can of the means of resistance we possess, and gratefully accepting the measure of success with which God has blessed our efforts as an evidence of his approval and favor, it is nevertheless the part of wisdom to carefully measure and husband our strength, and not to expect from it more than in the ordinary course of affairs it is capable of accomplishing. We should not, therefore, conceal from ourselves that our resources and men are constantly diminishing, and the disproportion in this respect between us and our enemies, if they continue united in their efforts to subjugate us, is steadily augmenting. He went on to explain that the strength of the Army of Northern Virginia was declining, and he argued that an effort should be made to divide the North by encouraging the Peace Party. Continuing, he said. Nor do I think we should, in this connection, make nice distinctions between those who declare for peace unconditionally and those who advocate it as a means of restoring the Union, however much we may prefer the former. We should bear in mind that the friends of peace at the North must make concessions to the earnest desire that exists in the minds of their countrymen for a restoration of the Union, and that to hold out such a result as an inducement is essential to the success of their party. Should the belief that peace will bring back the Union become general, the war would no longer be supported, and that, after all, is what we are interested in bringing about. When peace is proposed to us, it will be time enough to discuss its terms, and it is not the part of prudence to spurn the proposition in advance, merely because those who wish to make it believe, or affect to believe, that it will result in bringing us back to the Union. We entertain no such apprehensions, nor doubt that the desire of our people for a distinct and independent national existence will prove as steadfast under the influence of peaceful measures as it has shown itself in the midst of war. If the views I have indicated meet the approval of your excellency, you will best know how to give effect to them. Should you deem them inexpedient or impracticable, I think you will nevertheless agree with me that we should at least carefully abstain from measures or expressions that tend to discourage any party whose purpose is peace. With this statement of my own opinion on the subject, I leave to your better judgment to determine the proper course to be pursued. This letter was as ingenuous as it was sincere. So great was Lee's faith in the Southern people that he believed they would be willing to resume the war for independence in case peace negotiations produced no better terms than a return to the Union. With less knowledge of the state of mind of the North, he thought that, in like conditions, a powerful element would be willing to concede the independence of the South rather than have the war resumed. Unless this happened, he could see no other outcome of the struggle than the ultimate defeat of the Confederacy by the more powerful Union. This was 22 months before Appomattox. Following the dispatch of this letter, there came a period of confusion as to the intentions of the Federals. The War Department reported a raid up the Mattapony River, near Richmond, and an expedition from Suffolk on the south side of the James. Lee believed the former of these movements was a foray to destroy crops, but the concern of the administration was so deep that Lee was forced to approve the detention of Corse's brigade at Hanover Junction when Pickett's division at last moved to rejoin Longstreet. 
before the exact state of affairs below Richmond was determined, it P. Hill reported on the morning of June 14 that the enemy had withdrawn from the south bank of the Rappahannock and seemed to be evacuating Stafford Heights, but Lee hesitated to call the whole of Hill's new Third Corps to Culpeper until he was sure that none of it would be required to reinforce Richmond or Hanover Junction. Nor was he certain as to the disposition of the main body of the Army of the Potomac. He could only surmise that Hooker knew of his movements and was covering the approaches to Washington. The loss of time sustained by reason of this uncertainty might be serious enough, Lee feared, to defeat the full execution of his plans. By the morning of June 15, however, the situation began to clear. Acting under authorization given on the 9th, Hill had started Anderson's division for Culpeper in the confident belief that the Federals were really leaving the line of the Rappahannock. Ewell reported that he had cleared Berryville and was preparing to attack Winchester, which he had found more strongly fortified than he had expected. Ewell had been ordered not to delay his march for a siege of Winchester. Consequently, Lee assumed that Ewell on the 15th was already en route to Hagerstown. This would necessarily mean that the Army of Northern Virginia was spread out from some point north of Winchester to the lower Rappahannock. For a time there would be no force between Winchester and Culpeper except a few cavalry outposts. It was to meet just this situation that Lee had planned to advance Longstreet east of the Blue Ridge. On the 15th, in a personal conference with that the officer, followed by written orders later in the day, Lee outlined very simply the details of this operation. Longstreet was to start northward, with Hood's division, and was to be followed by McClaws and then by Pickett, three brigades of whose division had now reached Culpeper. Longstreet was to march to Markham, just east of Manassas Gap in the Blue Ridge, and was to demonstrate, if he saw fit, against any federal force he might encounter. Three brigades of cavalry were to operate on his front. His trains, if Longstreet so desired, could move by Chester Gap into the valley where they would be safe from federal raiders. Two brigades of cavalry were to be left behind to guard the fords of the Rappahannock and to cover the march of the Third Corps as it passed westward up the right bank of that stream. By this move Lee hoped to confuse the enemy as to his plan of action and also to facilitate the advance of Hill. The Federals would hardly attempt to advance far southward against Hill if they found a large force potentially in their rear. Should an attempt be made to destroy Longstreet, he could easily retire to Ashby's or to Snicker's Gap and hold it against the enemy. In case of a Federal advance northward to head off Ewell in Pennsylvania, Longstreet could readily move into the valley, occupy the gaps, and hasten by unhindered marches to Ewell's support. If all went well, the original plan of having Hill pass in rear of Longstreet could be executed without danger, and Longstreet's corps would then act as rear guard. There were thus to be four successive movements, Ewell's advance toward Hagerstown, Longstreet's march to the east of the mountain passes, Hill's tramp up the Rappahannock and thence along Ewell's route, and Longstreet's final withdrawal through the mountains and to the Potomac. These stages of the elaborate maneuver are marked, in order, by the numerals on the sketch shown opposite. On the evening of the day that Longstreet left Culpeper, Lee received good news, Ewell had driven Milroy from Winchester the previous night and had captured some 4,000 prisoners, the greater part of Milroy's force. The whole of Ewell's corps was now free to advance to the Potomac. Two of Hill's divisions were on the road to Culpeper, and the third was ready to leave Fredericksburg. It was now time for Lee to move in person. By the 17th, having sent Rooney to his wife's home with many affectionate messages, Lee broke up headquarters and rode to Markham. On his arrival, he found that Stuart had been engaged that day in hot actions with the enemy's cavalry at Aldi in Middleburg but had not established contact with the Federal infantry. From Hooker's failure to face him, Lee continued to assume that his adversary was moving toward the Potomac. Reports from some of the scouts on the 18th and 19th confirmed this, though it was not clear whether Hooker would make for Harper's Ferry, enter the valley, or cross the river somewhere in the vicinity of Leesburg. Stewart's scouts insisted that the enemy infantry were encamped east of the mountains, inactive. Major John S. Mosby had captured a dispatch in which Hooker's chief of staff had notified the commander of the Cavalry Corps that the advance of the infantry is suspended until further information of the enemy's movements, but Hooker had added in a later paragraph, if Lee's army is in rear of his cavalry, we shall move up by forced marches with the infantry. The same dispatch spoke, also, of a cavalry raid toward Warrington.
It mentioned, further, that pontoons were being assembled at the mouth of the Monocacy, which enters the Potomac directly east of the Catoctin Range. All this important information was dated from Fairfax Station, June 17, 10.30 p.m., and when received was nearly 48 hours old. In addition to this uncertainty, Lee had to contend with an unexpected difficulty on the Potomac. When Ewell had entered Maryland, he had left Rhodes's division at Williamsport to guard his rear, and was advancing with only two divisions. Lee reasoned that if the Federals remained south of the Potomac and offered no opposition to Ewell, that officer, with his three divisions, could accomplish as much in the collection of supplies as the whole army could hope to do in the face of the enemy. It was desirable, therefore, to relieve Rhodes at once, so that Ewell would have his whole corps with him. Lee accordingly started Hood's division for the Potomac on the 18th to relieve Rhodes. Unfortunately, a threatened movement against Snickers Gap compelled him to recall Hood. This made it necessary for Lee to await the arrival of Hill's leading division, which he could send on, in place, of Hood, to relieve Rhodes. Time would be required to do this. All operations were being slowed down by the scarcity of food, though Lee was keeping every wheel turning in the effort to gather provisions. Anxious as Lee was that Ewell should be left unhindered to gather supplies from Pennsylvania, he must have reinforcements in position to move to Ewell's support the moment Hooker showed signs of crossing the Potomac. It was desirable, of course, to await the arrival of Hill's rear division, which was just west of Culpeper, but if Hooker moved before Hill was massed, Lee's intention was to hurry Longstreet to Ewell. Lee had, therefore, to shape his plans for quick execution in an emergency. In doing this the handling of the infantry presented no special problems, but as the cavalry was detached, Lee had a conference with Longstreet and Stuart to arrange for the movement of the mounted forces. There was not then, nor was there at any later time, the least doubt in his mind as to the function of the main body of the cavalry in the general plan, it should keep the enemy as far to the east as possible, protect the lines of communication, and supply information as to the movements of the enemy. To do these things, the cavalry should of course operate on the right flank of the army as it advanced. For the time Lee believed that two brigades should be left to hold the passes of the Blue Ridge till the infantry were safely across the Potomac. The remaining three brigades should accompany the army. Jenkins's and Imboden's cavalry, which had not been part of Stuart's former command, could be employed to cover Ewell's advance. But Stuart had a more ambitious plan. The Richmond newspapers had expressed disappointment over his showing at Fleetwood and had called on him to perform some great feat that would restore his reputation. Probably inspired by this, Stuart proposed that when he left two brigades in the mountains he should take the three others, move to Hooker's rear, and annoy him if he attempted to cross the river. Should he find that Hooker was intent on going into Maryland, he could break off and rejoin the army. Longstreet approved this proposal, and Lee assented, in principle, but he told Stuart that when he discovered that Hooker was actually passing the river, he must immediately cross himself and take his place on our right flank as we moved north. There the matter ended for the time. On the 19th Lee passed through Ashby's Gap to Millwood, three miles northeast of White Post, and the next day established headquarters at a point a short distance beyond Berryville on the Charlestown Road, where he determined to wait until the whole of Hill's Corps came up. Longstreet was put on the alert to start for the Potomac and, through a misunderstanding of his orders, withdrew on the 20th from the mountain gaps and established himself west of the Shenandoah. By ill fortune the enemy selected the 21st for a general cavalry advance on Stuart and drove him back into Ashby's Gap by nightfall. As the Federals had infantry support, there was danger that they might seize the pass and might pour into the valley on Longstreet's rear when he began his march toward the Potomac. McClaws's division had to be sent back to prevent this. At daylight on the 22d, however, it was found that the Union infantry had withdrawn and that the cavalry was retiring eastward. Stuart followed vigorously. The presence of Union infantry so far north and its failure to attempt to force the gap was the strongest sort of evidence that the enemy was making for the Potomac east of the Blue Ridge. Additional information began to filter in during the day indicating that the Federals were preparing to cross the river, though Lee was still not satisfied as to the exact location of the main force. Provided the army could be subsisted, it was still, of course, the policy of wisdom to detain Hooker south of the Potomac while Ewell, undisturbed, continued to collect supplies in Pennsylvania.
So long as Hooker remained where he was and did not give battle, Lee could have many of the benefits of invasion with none of the risks and losses. But the enemy was too close to the Potomac for comfort. If Hooker could steal even one march on Lee he might get across the river and perhaps interpose between Ewell and the remainder of the army. Lee had already had one unhappy experience with a division of force on the north side of the Potomac during the Sharpsburg campaign and he had no desire to repeat it. Besides, the whole of Hill's corps was now closer at hand and there was no reason for waiting. It was safest, on every count, to move to the Potomac without further delay. If this were done, Ewell could be permitted to continue his march toward the Susquehanna because the remainder of the army would soon be within supporting distance. Anderson's division was ordered to the river, Ewell was instructed to move on if ready. He was to proceed in two columns. One was to advance by Greencastle and Chambersburg toward Harrisburg. The other was to march by Emmitsburg and Gettysburg toward York, east of the mountains that formed a barrier to the Cumberland Valley. This second route was chosen so as to keep the enemy at a distance from Lee's lines of communications. Before giving the order for the movement of Longstreet, Lee had to decide finally the question of the disposition of the five brigades of cavalry with Stuart. Jenkins was already in advance of Ewell in Pennsylvania, and Bowdoin was in Hampshire County, where he had been operating against the line of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The remaining five brigades were in or near the Blue Ridge. As Lee reflected on Stewart's proposal to take three of these brigades and operate in rear of the Federals during their advance northward, he became apprehensive. If Stewart did this, he might be delayed in crossing the river east of the mountains and might not be able to perform his principal mission, that of covering the right of the army in Pennsylvania. In order that Stewart might understand fully that this duty in Pennsylvania was the all-important thing, Lee instructed Major Charles Marshall, in answering a communication from Stewart, to cover the point. Soon Marshall submitted this. Headquarters, June 22, 1863. Major General J. E. B. Stewart. Commanding Cavalry. I have just received your note of 745 this morning to General Longstreet. I judge the efforts of the enemy yesterday were to arrest our progress and ascertain our whereabouts. Perhaps he is satisfied. Do you know where he is and what he is doing? I fear he will steal a march on us and get across the Potomac before we are aware. If you find that he is moving northward, and that two brigades can guard the Blue Ridge and take care of your rear, you can move with the other three into Maryland and take position of General Ewell's right, place yourself in communication with him, guard his flank, keep him informed on the enemy's movements, and collect all the supplies you can for the use of the army. One column of General Ewell's army will probably move toward the Susquehanna by the Emmitsburg route, another by Chambersburg. Accounts from him last night state that there was no enemy west of Frederick. A cavalry force, about 100, guarded the Monocacy Bridge, which was barricaded. You will, of course, take charge of Jenkins' brigade and give him necessary instructions. All supplies taken in Maryland must be by authorized staff officers for their respective departments, by no one else. They will be paid for, or receipts for the same given to the owner. I will send you a general order on this subject, which I wish you to see is strictly complied with. Lee read this letter and approved it, but had to take into account two contingencies, was Longstreet in position to entrust his rear to two brigades only, and, secondly, where could Stuart most readily cross the Potomac without disclosing the movements of the army? Might it not be well for Stuart to go east of the Bull Run Mountains, perhaps through Hopewell Gap, and then pass by the rear of the enemy, thus creating a doubt as to the objective of the army? Might not that be better than crossing west of the Blue Ridge or heading for the Potomac between the Blue Ridge and the Bull Run Mountains? Probably because he knew Stuart's propensity for daring, spectacular raids, Lee decided to refer the question of Stuart's best route to Longstreet, along with the question on which Longstreet would properly had to pass, that of whether two brigades were sufficient to hold the passes. He sent the letter to Stuart under cover of a note to Longstreet, with instructions to forward the message to Stuart if he saw fit to do so. The next day, June 23, the information as to the enemy's movements was somewhat conflicting. Stuart reported that on the night of the 22d his cavalry outposts had advanced as far as Aldi.
He seemed to be troubled by the statement, in a captured dispatch, that a column of cavalry was moving southward to Warrington, whereas the Army of the Potomac was supposed to be making northward. Later in the day he sent word that Major Mosby had gone east of the Bull Run Mountains and had found the enemy's infantry quietly waiting in his scattered camps. On the other hand, Lee's scouts affirmed that the Federal Corps which had been at Leesburg had withdrawn and that the enemy was laying a pontoon bridge at Edwards Ferry on the Potomac, six miles east of Leesburg. Now, if the information as to preparations for a crossing at Edwards Ferry were correct, that would mean two things, first, and obviously, that Hooker's design was to cross east of the Catoctin Mountains, and, secondly, that if the Army of the Potomac was concentrating on Edwards Ferry, its long columns would be spread some distance southward on all the roads, making them impassable for Stuart. It followed, therefore, that if Stuart operated far in the rear of the enemy, he would almost certainly be compelled to cross the Potomac east of Edwards Ferry in order to perform his major duty of covering the right flank of the army after it entered Pennsylvania. This was a geographical fact that will be apparent from the sketch on page 46, which gives the general direction but not the exact routes of columns converging on Edwards Ferry. Hooker, of course, would require a long time to move his immense army across the Potomac. There was, consequently, no reason why Stuart could not ride around him, pass the river east of Edwards Ferry, and reach the right flank of the Confederate column in Maryland before Hooker would be dangerously close. Stuart's march to Frederick by this route would be only some 40 miles, whereas if he rode in Hooker's rear as far as the vicinity of Centerville and then turned back, crossed the mountains and passed in rear of the Confederate army via Shepherdstown, he would have to cover 80 miles to Frederick. But the wisdom of a crossing east of Edwards Ferry and passing over the Potomac was contingent on Stuart's being able to disorganize the federal wagon trains and confuse the crossing without being materially delayed. If he lost his way, or became confused among the moving federal columns, or stopped to indulge his fondness for fighting, he might be late. It was necessary, therefore, to make it plain to Stuart that while he could cross the Potomac east of Hooker's army, he must put his major mission first and must not attempt to ride around the Federal Army if he were hindered in the attempt. But suppose Stuart was right in saying the enemy was inactive, suppose Hooker had no intention of making early use of the pontoon bridge at Edwards Ferry, suppose there was significance in the report that a Federal column of cavalry was moving southward to Warrington, what then? If the enemy was simply waiting, it was much more important that Stuart should be with the army on its advance into Pennsylvania than that he should remain east of the mountains in Virginia with his whole force, merely watching Hooker. And if the enemy was not moving northward, but was aiming at Warrington, there was no reason why Stuart should waste his strength and wear down his horses in futile battles in dealing with diversions. He had better conserve his men and mounts, withdraw west of the Blue Ridge as soon as the army was beyond the Potomac, and then perform his major mission. Once the army of invasion was in the enemy's country, all such columns as that which was reported to be moving on Warrington would be recalled by Hooker. Meantime the two brigades left in the mountains would have to deal as best they could with raids on Warrington or the lines of communication. In view of all this, only part of which was known to Stuart, Lee prudently decided, in answering Stuart's dispatches of the day, to cover the operations of the cavalry and the contingencies that might develop and to explain once again that its main function was to cover the right of the army in Pennsylvania. Lee directed Marshall to do this in further instructions. Marshall demurred on the ground that Stuart had been told in person and in the dispatch of June 22 precisely how he should act, but Lee insisted, and Marshall prepared a letter in which he said, if General Hooker's army remains inactive, you can leave two brigades to watch him and withdraw with the three others, but should he not appear to be moving northward, I think you had better withdraw this side of the mountains tomorrow night, cross at Shepherdstown next day, and move over to Frederickstown. You will, however, be able to judge whether you can pass around their army without hindrance, doing them all the damage you can, and cross the river east of the mountains. In either case, after crossing the river, you must move on and feel the right of Ewell's troops, collecting information, provisions, etc. Give instructions to the commander of the brigades left behind to watch the flank and rear of the army and, in the event of the enemy leaving their front, retire from the mountains west of the Shenandoah, leaving sufficient pickets to guard the passes and bring everything clean along the valley, closing upon the rear of the army. As regards the movements of the two brigades of the enemy moving toward Warrington, the commander of the brigades to be left in the mountains must do what he can to counteract them, but I think the sooner you cross into Maryland, after tomorrow, the better. The movements of Ewell's corps are as stated in my former letter.
Hill's 1st Division will reach the Potomac today, and Longstreet will follow tomorrow. Be watchful and circumspect in all your movements. It is possible that Marshall was less careful than he should have been in drafting this letter because he was confident that Stuart had been fully told what to do, but the meaning is plain enough when the dispatch is read in the light of the information Lee and Stuart then possessed. Lee did not intend to require that Stuart cross into Maryland immediately east of the mountains, as has been so often claimed. In the situation that actually developed, Lee undoubtedly intended to give Stuart discretion, after midnight of June 24, to pass around the Federal Rear, which meant crossing the Potomac east of Edwards Ferry. The one proviso was that Stuart must not be so hindered in following the routes as to be delayed in performing his principal service in the campaign, that of covering the Confederate right in the enemy's country. This was the all-important thing, Stuart was not to attempt to pass around the enemy's rear if he met with hindrance or delay. In case he did, he was to withdraw west of the mountains and follow the army into Pennsylvania. Even when these orders had been issued to protect the flank of the army when it moved into Pennsylvania, Lee still looked about to see what further measures he could take to strengthen himself for the test that awaited him in the enemy's country. In the hope the course and cook might be spared to reinforce him, he urged the War Department to send them forward. One other possibility presented itself, the employment in his support of Beauregard's troops whom he had suggested, while still at Culpeper, that the president send either to Virginia or to join Johnston in the West. He now proposed formally that Beauregard come to Virginia in person, if with only a small force, and establish himself at Culpeper Courthouse. This, he argued, would not only effect a diversion most favorable for this army, but would, I think, relieve us of any apprehension of an attack upon Richmond during our absence. If success should attend the operations of this army, and what I now suggest would greatly increase the probability of that result, we might even hope to compel the recall of some of the enemy's troops from the West. Lee's plan, in short, was to utilize the inner lines of the Confederacy in playing on Lincoln the game that had so embarrassed the Richmond authorities when McDowell had been threatening an advance from Fredericksburg while McClellan was in front of Richmond. If the president approved his idea, Hooker would have to detach troops to combat Beauregard. In that way, the powerful and united army of Hooker might be weakened and divided long enough for Lee to strike a staggering blow. Lee had already suggested to General Samuel Jones that he undertake a diversion in western Virginia. On the morning of the 24th, while the long columns were slowly moving under the June skies down the valley toward the crossings of the Potomac, Lee rode from rear to front with his staff. On the road, he overtook Colonel Epa Hunton, who was leading Garnett's brigade of Pickett's division in the absence of its sick brigadier. For half an hour he traveled with Hunton and talked of the adventures that awaited them on the other side of the river. Hunton, though second to none in desperate valor, was apprehensive of the outcome and frankly stated that a disaster in Pennsylvania might make withdrawal to Virginia difficult. Lee had his own misgivings, but in the presence of his subordinates he was always cheerful and confident. To Hunton, he appeared most enthusiastic as he explained that an advance into northern territory was necessary because provisions and supplies of every kind had been very nearly exhausted in Virginia. The invasion, he said, gave promise of success and would either end the war or allow the army rest for some time to come. After arriving opposite Williamsport, Lee received from the president a letter in which Mr. Davis endorsed Lee's views on the encouragement of the Peace Party in the North. In answering this on the morning of June 25, Lee reverted to his proposal that Beauregard be moved to Virginia, if only with a skeleton command. Already, he said, federal apprehension for the safety of Washington was causing the Federals to recall troops for its defense, all the federal force at Suffolk was reported to be evacuating, and General Buckner stated that Burnside's corps was being sent back from Kentucky. I think, Lee said, this should liberate the troops in the Carolinas and enable Generals Buckner and Bragg to accomplish something in Ohio. It is plain that if all the federal army is concentrated upon this, it will result in our accomplishing nothing and being compelled to return to Virginia. If the plan that I suggested the other day, of organizing an army, even in effigy, under General Beauregard at Culpeper Courthouse, can be carried into effect, much relief will be afforded. If even the brigades in Virginia and North Carolina, which Generals Hill and Elsie think cannot be spared, were ordered there at once, and General Beauregard were sent there, if he had to return to South Carolina, it would do more to protect both states from marauding expeditions of the enemy than anything else. 
Then he quietly announced to the president what had doubtless been apparent to him as a possibility from the time he had found that he would have to undertake his expedition, if at all, with only the troops then at his disposal, I have not sufficient troops to maintain my communication and, therefore, have to abandon them. The army would have to take the great risk of living off the country. Imboden had supplied some beef, Ewell had been told that the ability of the rest of the army to follow him into Pennsylvania would depend on the supplies collected, and he was collecting beef and flour. But that was all that had been assured Lee. Much food must be bought. The crossing had been set for a time when there was reason to expect that the Potomac would be low and fordable for weeks, but if provisions should fail and the river rise, what would happen to the army? Moreover, the artillery ammunition that could be carried with the army was just sufficient for one heavy battle. Lee hoped that if the operations were favorable, he could bring up more ammunition under a cavalry escort and that the abandonment of communication would not be complete, but that was a long chance in a campaign that Lee now hoped to continue north of the Potomac until fall. He did not magnify his possible achievements as he closed his letter to the president. I think, he said, I can throw General Hooker's army across the Potomac and draw troops from the South, embarrassing their plan of campaign in a measure, if I can do nothing more and have to return. I still hope that all things will end well for us at Vicksburg. At any rate, every effort should be made to bring about that result. He had omitted nothing, so far as he then knew, to reduce the inevitable risks. To summarize. The two corps then with him were to advance to Chambersburg in support of Ewell's advance columns and, at the fitting moment, were to move toward the Susquehanna and destroy the rail communications with the West. On this second stage of the advance, Hill was to follow a route east of the mountains to keep the enemy at a distance, and Longstreet to move directly north on Harrisburg. Jenkins's cavalry brigade was to move in front of the army, Imboden on the left, and Stuart with three brigades on the right, operating in the direction of Baltimore so as to force an enemy concentration as far eastward as possible. Jones and Robertson were to cover the rear until the enemy was across the Potomac and were then to join the main army, keeping to its right and rear. Reinforcements, if sent forward, were to go by train to Culpeper, march thence through Chester Gap and northward down the valley to Winchester, where they would receive orders. To relieve pressure on Vicksburg, and to brighten the prospect of success by the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee had made four proposals, that General Samuel Jones advance on the enemy in Western Virginia, that Bragg and Buckner move against the diminished federal force in Kentucky, and that Beauregard, stripping the South Atlantic coast, move to Culpeper Courthouse and threaten Washington from the south while the president undertook a peace offensive, directed against the morale of the North. All these efforts were to be coordinated. The supreme endeavor of the South to win its independence was now to be made. So far as the Army of Northern Virginia was concerned, the hour had come. In the midst of a heavy rain on the morning of June 25, the band struck up Dixie, the cheering division began to move, and the man who carried his nation's hope turned traveler's head into the Potomac. Chapter 5, Lee Hears a Fateful Cannonade Like the three witches who on another day so foul and fair met Macbeth on the heath, a group of ladies under dripping umbrellas awaited Lee on the Maryland side of the Potomac, not to hail him as Thane of Cotter, but to wish him victory on his second invasion of the North. Their spokesman, whom Captain Dawson in a most ungallant phrase charged with having a face like a door knocker, stepped forward as Lee rode up. This is General Lee, I presume? Lee admitted his identity. General Lee, she went one, allow me to present to you these ladies who were determined to give you this reception. Lee thanked her and introduced General Longstreet and General Pickett, whose flowing locks fell back from eyes that never failed to see all that was comely in the other sex. Then came flowers and fair words and, at length, a wreath the ladies desired to put around the bowed gray neck of Traveler. Lee balked at this. Garlands were well enough for Stuart, but for the mount of an infantryman commanding an army of invasion on a desperate venture, well, he was extremely indebted to the ladies for their courtesy, but would they excuse him? Marylanders of the persuasive sex who had braved rain and radicals to do honor to a rebel were not so easily put off. A parley ensued, with the ladies insistent and Lee resolute. It was compromised at length by giving the wreath to a courier to carry for the general. The holiday spirit of this welcome persisted. After Lee's column stopped in a hickory grove on a hill three miles from Williamsport, Colonel Taylor spoke up. General, he said, 
This gentleman has brought me some raspberries, and I have asked him to take snack with us. Lee turned quickly and saw Leighton Parks, the little boy who had visited him in Maryland the previous year. He smiled, I have had the pleasure of meeting your friend before, he answered. Then he stopped, lifted the youngster and kissed him. He had the lad eat with his mess and then took him into his tent, put him on his knee and talked to him until General Hill demanded the same privilege. After Hill, Longstreet insisted on a chat and confidentially whispered that he had a pony he thought could carry the boy's weight if he would join his staff. At length, when Lee resumed his duties, Hill told an orderly to bring the captain's horse, and after it developed that the youngster could not mount so high, Lee lifted him into the saddle. Give him time, he said, and he'll do for the cavalry yet. The friendly spirit of the invasion was somewhat the same the next morning, June 26, when Lee left his camp and rode through Hagerstown en route to Chambersburg, whither Hills and Longstreet's columns were moving. Although it was raining again, another company of ladies surrounded him, and one of them asked for a lock of his hair. As the general's grizzled coverage was beginning to thin, he made that his excuse. Besides, he said, he was sure they would prefer a ringlet from a younger officer. There was General Pickett, surely he would be glad to give her one of his curls. This did not appeal strongly to Pickett, who had left his heart in Virginia, nor did the proposal impress the young lady. Those who had seen the general at the time of the first invasion of Maryland remarked that he had aged perceptibly in ten months, but Southern sympathizers did not leonize him less on that account, and even one Northern girl who persisted in waving a Union flag was heard to say as he passed, oh, I wish he was ours, a remark that must have been the text of many a quip among irreverent and envious young staff officers. From Hagerstown he rode northward and entered Pennsylvania for the first time since the beginning of the war. Hill had gone ahead and as Lee rode toward the public square in Chambersburg, Hill came down the street and met him. Another throng was awaiting him, and a man with a camera was stationed in a window, only to have his picture ruined by soldiers who insisted on being included in it. Posterity will not readily forgive them their forwardness, for if the artist had not been interrupted he doubtless would have taken a photograph of high historical interest. However, if the good people of Chambersburg could not have a picture, they could at least have a look, and they idly critically, if with awe. What a large neck he has, one civilian whispered. Yes, said a nearby Confederate, it takes a damn big neck to hold his head. Lee moved on and established headquarters in a little grove out from the town on the road to Gettysburg, a picnicking place, known as Shatters Woods and later as Messersmith's Woods. A Confederate flag marks the whereabouts, an Austrian visitor wrote. There are about half a dozen tents and as many baggage wagons and ambulances. The horses and mules from these, besides those of a small escort, are tied up to the trees or grazing about the place. Here the atmosphere was not that of merrymaking, but of preparation for battle. Lee's first concern, on the 27th, was to assure the safety of private property. Before he had left Virginia he had talked on the subject with General Trimble and had expressed himself strongly against the retaliatory acts that were being urged on him in many letters. I cannot hope, he had said, that heaven will prosper our cause when we are violating its laws. I shall, therefore, carry on the war in Pennsylvania without offending the sanctions of a high civilization and of Christianity. It had been in the spirit that he had issued orders on June 21 governing the seizure of supplies for the army while in the enemy's country. He had then directed that all the necessities of the army should be met by formal requisition on local authorities or by purchase and payment in Confederate money. Where Confederate notes were refused, the quartermasters were to issue receipts, setting forth the name of the owner of the seized property, the quantity and the fair market value. These instructions had been measurably respected by Ewell's troops, but now that the whole army was in a district where Lee expected it to remain for some time, the regulations were reiterated in General Orders No. 73 for the guidance of the individual soldiers. After thanking the men for their fortitude and loyal performance of duty, Lee said. Their conduct in other respects has, with few exceptions, been in keeping with their character as soldiers and entitles them to approbation and praise. There have, however, been instances of forgetfulness on the part of some that they have in keeping the yet unsullied reputation of the army and that the duties exacted of us by civilization and Christianity are not less obligatory in the country of the enemy than in our own.
the commanding general considers that no greater disgrace could befall the army and through it our whole people than the perpetration of the barbarous outrages upon the unarmed and defenseless and the wanton destruction of private property that have marked the course of the enemy in our own country. Such proceedings not only degrade the perpetrators and all connected with them, but are subversive of the discipline and efficiency of the army and destructive of the ends of our present movement. It must be remembered that we make war only upon armed men, and that we cannot take vengeance for the wrongs our people have suffered without lowering ourselves in the eyes of all whose abhorrence has been excited by the atrocities of our enemies, and offending against him to whom vengeance belongeth, without whose favor and support our efforts must all prove in vain. The commanding general therefore earnestly exhorts the troops to abstain with most scrupulous care from unnecessary or wanton injury to private property, and he enjoins upon all officers to arrest and bring to summary punishment all who shall in any way offend against the orders on the subject. These orders were written, no doubt, with an eye to the encouragement of the peace movement in the North, for mercy disarms hate, but they were drafted in sincerity and they were enforced with vigor, despite some grumbling in the army and some protests at home. No officer below the rank of general was allowed to go into Chambersburg without a special pass from Lee, which he was slow to give. By daily reminders and by careful example, as when he stopped on the road opposite a pasture to put up bars that some negligent soldier had left down, he succeeded in protecting property from damage and women from insult. There were no charges of rape and few of plundering. The chief difficulty of the officers was in keeping hot, bareheaded soldiers from snatching civilians' hats as they marched through the crowd-lined streets of the little towns. This was repeatedly done in the presence of officers, who invariably tried to have the offending person pointed out that the stolen property might be restored and the offender punished, but in the similarity of the men and the necessity for the column to keep moving on, not a single one was detected, so testified a northern writer. Regardless of hats, the army had to be ready for action. By the 27th Ewell was well advanced in two columns, one as far as Carlisle on the road to Harrisburg, and the other, which consisted of Early's division, within about six miles of York. Ewell's orders were to take Harrisburg if his force was adequate, and Early was under instructions to cut the railroad between Harrisburg and Baltimore and to destroy the bridges at Wrightsville and Columbia. Longstreet's and Hill's corps were encamped around Chambersburg and Fayetteville, in excellent health and full of confidence, far better shod and clad than when they had entered Maryland in 1862. The general advance of the army was to be on Harrisburg, in order to draw the enemy out and to cut communications between east and west. The execution of the plan depended primarily on the arrival of Stuart's cavalry, for it manifestly was dangerous, if not impossible, to move freely so long as nothing was known of the position of the Federals. Presumably, Hooker was still in Virginia. Otherwise, Stuart would surely have notified Lee. But the uncertainty hampered operations. While waiting for Stuart, Lee checked his maps carefully by all the information he could get from Southern sympathizers, and he had a lengthy interview with Major General Trimble, who had been chief engineer for one of the nearby railroads and knew the country well. Trimble told him there was scarcely a square mile east of the mountains in Adams County that did not offer good positions for maneuver or for battle. Lee was pleased at the assurance, our army, he was quoted long afterwards by Trimble as saying, is in good spirits, not overfatigued, and can be concentrated on any one point in 24 hours or less. I have not yet heard that the enemy have crossed the Potomac and am waiting to hear from General Stewart. When they hear where we are, they will make forced marches to interpose their forces between us and Baltimore and Philadelphia. I shall throw an overwhelming force on their advance, crush it, follow up the success, drive one corps back on another, and by successive repulses and surprises, before they can concentrate, create a panic and virtually destroy the army. Trimble expressed his belief that this could be done, because the morale of the troops had never been higher. That is, I hear, the general impression, Lee answered. Then, as Trimble rose to go, Lee laid his hand on the map and pointed to a little town east of the mountains, Gettysburg by name, from which roads radiated like so many spokes. Hereabout, he said, we shall probably meet the enemy and fight a great battle, and if God gives us the victory, the war will be over and we shall achieve the recognition of our independence. Bidding the stout-hearted Trimble adieu, Lee turned to the further study of the map and to the administration of the affairs of the 40,000 men who waited in their camps for his word to go forward. Much he had to do, also, for the civilians who came to him freely with the troubles the invasion brought to their households. 
he dealt with them as considerately as he could, seeking always to promote peace sentiment. One woman who visited headquarters with a request that he make provision for the hungry in Chambersburg remained long enough to ask for his autograph. Do you want the autograph of a rebel? he asked, in surprise. General Lee, she retorted, I am a true Union woman, yet I ask for bread and your autograph. It is to your interest, he answered, to be for the Union, and I hope that you may be as firm in your principles as I am in mine. Lee told her that his autograph might be a dangerous souvenir for her to possess, but when she insisted, he gave it to her and turned the conversation to the cruelties of war. His only desire, he said, was that they would let him go home and eat his bread in peace. The 28th came, and still no word of the enemy, of Stuart, or of the cavalry that had been left behind to guard the passes of the Blue Ridge. Outwardly, Lee continued calm and cheerful, but inwardly his apprehension rose, and he began to wonder if the absence of reports from Stuart meant that the federal commander was contemplating an attack on Richmond while the Army of Northern Virginia was above the Potomac. However, taking no news to mean no danger, that day he ordered Ewell to pursue his advance on Harrisburg, with Longstreet and probably Hill to follow on the 29th. As the day passed without other incident, Lee's wonder at the silence of Stuart increased, and when he retired for the night, it must have been with amazement that an officer who was in the habit of reporting so promptly and regularly should have sent no messenger since the army had crossed the Potomac on the 25th, Stuart had been told plainly that if he found Hooker moving northward, when he was himself sure of the safety of the mountain passes, he was to move into Maryland and take position. On Ewell's right. That was Stuart's chief mission and a fundamental of the whole plan of operations, for it was an essential precaution of invasion to keep a heavy cavalry screen between the army and the enemy. After ten o'clock on the night of the 28th, there came a rap on Lee's tent pole, and when Lee answered, Major John W. Fairfax of Longstreet's staff entered and announced that Harrison, one of Longstreet's scouts, had arrived and had brought the startling news that Hooker was north of the Potomac. It seemed so incredible, in the absence of all confirmation, that Lee was skeptical. I do not know what to do, he said to Fairfax, I cannot hear from General Stewart, the eye of the army. What do you think of Harrison? I have no confidence in any scout, but General Longstreet thinks a good deal of Harrison. Fairfax had no opinion and went his way. Later in the evening, Lee decided to talk with Harrison and sent for him. The scout duly reported, a stoop-shouldered, bearded man about five feet, eight inches tall, well-dressed in civilian clothes, but dusty and very tired. The spy said that he had left Longstreet at Culpeper and had gone to Washington, where he had frequented the saloons and had picked up much gossip. Hearing that Hooker had crossed the Potomac, he had started for Frederick, walking at night and mingling with the soldiers during the day. At Frederick, he had found two corps of infantry, one to the right and the other to the left of the town. He had heard of a third corps nearby but had not been able to locate it. Having learned that the Army of Northern Virginia was at Chambersburg, he had procured a horse and had hurried northward. On the way to Chambersburg, he had ascertained that two more corps were close to South Mountain. Incidentally, he had heard that General Hooker had been replaced by Lee's old comrade and friend, Major General George Gordon Meade. Lee heard Harrison through without a tremor, but he was profoundly concerned by the intelligence the spy brought. Hooker on the north side of the Potomac, close to his rear, and not a cavalryman at hand to ascertain whither he was moving. There could hardly have been worse news. Lee had not fully carried out his design of abandoning his communications with Virginia. There had, as yet, been no reason for doing so. Although he did not consider his line to the Potomac open for all purposes, he still believed that if a strong cavalry escort were supplied, he could bring up ammunition from Virginia as long as the Federals were east of South Mountain. But if the Army of the Potomac was already at the foot of that ridge, the new commander would almost certainly cross, move westward and destroy the Confederate communications. Not only so, but if the Federals got into Cumberland Valley, they might force Lee to conform and thereby rob him of the initiative, which he must retain for the type of campaign he hoped to conduct. The situation instantly became one of gravity, and because of Stuart's unexplained absence, the army was blindfolded. Almost as soon, therefore, as Harrison had finished his story, Lee determined on his course of action.
the advance of Ewell on Harrisburg must be abandoned, the Second Corps must be recalled, Longstreet's and Hill's orders to march northward must be cancelled, the whole army must be concentrated at once and must be moved east of the mountains so as to compel the Federals to follow and thereby to abandon their threat to Lee's rear. As there was no way of ascertaining when Stuart would arrive, Imboden's cavalry, which was operating to the westward, must be called in, and the two mounted brigades that had been left behind in the passes of the Blue Ridge must be brought up immediately. Orders flew fast. A messenger hurried off to Carlisle to recall Ewell. Another took the road back to Virginia with orders to Robertson and W. E. Jones to hasten forward. By 7.30 a.m. Lee had so far developed his plan that he saw there was danger of delaying the movement by crowding too many troops on the road from Chambersburg eastward, so he modified Ewell's orders and directed him to march directly from Carlisle toward Cashtown or Gettysburg. Hill was to use the road that led over the mountains from Chambersburg to these towns, and he was to be followed the next day, June 30, by Longstreet, who was to leave one division to guard the rear until the arrival of Imboden's cavalry. The day of the 29th had broken dark and stormy, and Lee's feelings were gloomy. As he prepared to mount for the day he saw a former staff officer of Jackson's who had just come up from Virginia, and he eagerly inquired of him if he had any news of Stuart. The officer replied that he had met on the road two cavalrymen who had said that on the 27th they had left Stuart in Prince William County, Virginia. Lee was surprised and visibly disturbed. Repeatedly during the day he inquired for additional news of the movements of the cavalry. Not a word further did he hear. All Jenkins's troopers were with Ewell, Early had the only other organized unit, White's battalion. Why Jones and Robertson were delayed, Lee did not know. Imboden, who might at least have supplied men for a reconnaissance, was two days' journey away. So completely was Lee stripped of cavalry that the foraging actually had to be done by men mounted on horses from the artillery or the wagon train. But this did not compass the whole of Lee's embarrassment. Not only was he entirely without cavalry for an advance against an enemy who might soon be hanging on his front, but he also was deprived of the presence of Stuart himself, on whom he had been accustomed to rely for information that he had come to value as consistently accurate. A federal visitor found him restless and concerned during the day, but later he recovered his poise completely and jestingly told Hood, who came to call, Ah, General, the enemy is a long time finding us, if he does not succeed soon, we must go in search of him. When he went out to walk in the road for exercise, during the afternoon, his outward calm was as complete as ever and he announced quietly to some officers who attended him, Tomorrow, gentlemen, we will not move to Harrisburg, as we expected, but will go over to Gettysburg and see what General Meade is after. When asked for his opinion of the latest change in the command of the Army of the Potomac, he answered that he thought the federal cause benefited by the promotion of Meade, but that this was counterbalanced by the difficulties that Meade would encounter in taking charge of the forces in the midst of a campaign. He said then, or soon thereafter, General Meade will commit no blunder in my front, and if I make one he will make haste to take advantage of it. As Lee spoke, Haight's division of the Third Corps was moving to Cashtown, east of the mountains. The advance was slow on account of the rain, and cautious because of the absence of all information concerning the position of the enemy. Still with no news from Stuart, Lee speeded up the march on the morning of June 30. Hill went on with Pender to Cashtown, and two divisions of Longstreet's corps started on the same road from Chambersburg. Pickett remained behind, according to Lee's plan, to protect the rear until Imboden's arrival, Law's brigade was left on duty at New Guilford, and Anderson of Hill's corps, who was encamped at Fayetteville, east of Chambersburg, was directed to move on July 1. Lee himself left with Longstreet's troops on the 30th, and about 2 p.m. went into camp at a deserted sawmill near Greenwood, where he intended to wait until the next morning. Thus far on the road no enemy had been encountered. Such information as Lee could get from officers and men who had come up from the rear was to the effect that Meade was still at Middletown, about midway between Frederick and Boonesboro, and had not struck his tents to move. Late in the evening of the 30th, however, General Hill, who had ridden on to overtake his troops at Cashtown, sent back word that Pettigrew's brigade of Haight's division had gone on that day from Cashtown to Gettysburg to procure shoes. Near Gettysburg, Pettigrew had found Federal cavalry, and some of his officers reported that they had heard the roll of infantry drums beyond the town.
Having only his brigade with him and no cavalry support, Pettigrew had not felt justified in advancing farther and had returned to Cashtown. Lee could hardly believe this report, and even if it were true he could nothing until morning. Dawn of July first broke with a gentle breeze and was sunshiny and clear except for occasional showery clouds. Anderson's division passed Greenwood early to join its corps, which had spent the night between Cashtown and Gettysburg. Despite the uncertainty, Lee was cheerful and composed and called to Longstreet to ride with him. The men of the First Corps were confident, and as they swung into the road, doubtless every one of them shared the view Lee's adjutant general had expressed in a letter two days before, with God's help we expect to take a step or two toward an honorable peace. About six miles east of Chambersburg, the head of the First Corps found Johnson's division of Ewell's Corps pouring into the road from the northwest, in obedience to Lee's order for a quick concentration. It was a welcome assurance that the greater part of the army would be together for any adventure that lay beyond the mountains, but Johnson's men and their wagons blocked the road, over part of which, first and last, six divisions in the trains and reserve artillery of all three corps had to pass. Lee directed Longstreet to halt the First Corps and let Johnson have the road. After a short wait, however, Lee proposed that they ride ahead, and, with their staffs, he and Longstreet began to climb the mountain, past the toiling troops of Johnson. As they ascended, there was audible, above the tramp of horses and the familiar clatter of bayonets against canteens, an occasional distant rumble, artillery. At first Lee imagined that it was simply a brush with cavalry, but his lack of information irritated him. Ordinarily, in Virginia, no sooner would he hear the challenge of distant guns than a courier would ride up with a dispatch from Stuart explaining what was afoot, but now, where was Stuart and what did the firing mean? Lee could not altogether conceal his impatience and admitted frankly that he had been in the dark since he had crossed the Potomac. As they approached the crest of the divide, the sound of firing came insistently from the east. Lee could restrain himself no longer. Bidding Longstreet farewell, he quickened Traveler's pace and hurried on to Cashtown, where he met a P. Hill, sick and very pale. Hill knew little, except that Haight's division had gone ahead under instructions not to force an action if it encountered the enemy until the rest of the army came up. Soon Hill galloped off to see for himself what the cannonade meant. Hearing that Anderson's division was in the town, together with the reserve artillery of the Third Corps, Lee thought that Anderson might know something further, and he sent for him. As he waited, he listened intently to the sound that drifted sullenly over the rolling hills. He continued to listen for a moment after Anderson came up. Then he said, more to himself than to the general, I cannot think what has become of Stuart. I ought to have heard from him long before now. He may have met with disaster, but I hope not. In the absence of reports from him, I am in ignorance as to what we have in front of us here. It may be the whole federal army, it may be only a detachment. If it is the whole federal force, we must fight a battle here. If we do not gain a victory, those defile and gorges which we passed this morning will shelter us from disaster. Anderson had no information that Lee had not already received. After a few more words, he left Anderson and started onward again toward the sound of the guns, the opening guns of Gettysburg. Chapter 6 The Spirit That Inhibits Victory over the hills from Cashtown, along a road he had never traveled before, Lee galloped toward Gettysburg like a blinded giant. He did not know where the Federals were, or how numerous they might be. Ewell, and doubtless Hill also, he had cautioned not to bring on a general engagement with a strong adversary until the rest of the infantry came up, but with no cavalry to inform him, he could not tell what calamity he might invite by advancing at all, or what opportunity he might lose by advancing cautiously. Never had he been so dangerously in the dark. Louder and nearer was the sound of the artillery. Soon, to his regret and surprise, infantry volleys in a spiteful staccato added their treble to the base of the guns. Smoke was now visible on the horizon, swept by the breeze into a long cloud. At two o'clock, when he still was about three miles from Gettysburg, he came into the open country and found Pender's division deployed. In the distance, action was visible. He turned into a grassy field on the left of the road and found a position that commanded a good view. A cultivated ridge, long and wide and broken only by a few rail fences and patches of woodland, led down to Willoughby Run. 
Beyond that little stream, the ground rose to another ridge on which stood conspicuously a Lutheran seminary with a cupola. Over this ridge, to the east, at an elevation of about fifty feet below that of the ground on which Lee stood, was Gettysburg. South and southeast of the town, dimly discernible, were dangerous-looking hills and ridges. Lee's eyes could not have lingered long on their vague outlines, because his glasses must have fixed themselves quickly on the smoke that was rising on either side of the Chambersburg Road where it crossed Willoughby Run. Evidently, there had been an attack and a repulse. The artillery was blazing away, and Haight's division was apparently forming on a front about a mile in length. Two of Haight's brigades were in bad order. Beyond them, across the run, where the smoke from the Union batteries was swelling, must be the Federal infantry, and how strong? That was the question Lee's anxious mind instantly fashioned, was it a heavy force or merely a detached unit, sent to guard the Gettysburg crossroads? The guns did not seem very numerous, but the infantry fire came from a front at least as long as hates. That was ominous. Soon Lee's presence on the field became known, and officers began to bring him news. Haight had sent forward two of his brigades, archers and Davises, during the morning. They had pushed forward vigorously and had driven the enemy back. Later the Federals had attacked them in heavy force and, about an hour before Lee arrived, had compelled them to retire. Part of Archer's brigade had been cut off, and Archer himself had been captured. Haight was now resting his men in line of battle preparatory to attacking again with his entire division, and Hill had directed Pender to support him. Finding their opponents out of range, the Federal infantry had halted and had ceased firing. The artillery exchange was slowing down. As Lee rode closer to the lines he was still so uncertain of the strength of the opposing troops and so anxious not to bring on a general engagement until his whole army was concentrated that had there not been a sudden stir north of Gettysburg about three o'clock he would probably have forbidden an advance. The enemy began to move out troops in that direction, the right of the federal line that faced Hill was drawn in, firing commenced briskly. Soon from the woods above Gettysburg a long gray line of battle emerged. It was Rhodes's division of Ewell's corps, marching under orders to join Lee at Gettysburg. Having heard the sound of Hill's engagement, Rhodes had taken advantage of the cover on the ridge and was coming up almost on the right flank of the forces that had been engaged with Hill. It could not have happened more advantageously if this chance engagement had been a planned battle. The Federals rallied quickly to this new threat. As they deployed to meet Rhodes's attack, he had to change direction somewhat to the right. In doing this his left brigade, Dulce, shifted to confront a column that had started northward from the town as if to turn Rhodes's left. Dulce thus became detached from the rest of the command. O'Neill's brigade on his right thereupon lost direction and was scattered. The attack against the flank of the troops facing Hill had, therefore, to be delivered by two brigades, Daniels and Iversons, with Ramsers in reserve. The details of all this could not be seen, of course, from Lee's position, but it was soon apparent that Rhodes was having hard fighting, in the face of stubborn resistance, and was not advancing rapidly. General Haight rode up to Lee. Rhodes, said he, is heavily engaged, had I not better attack? No, said Lee, reasoning that little was to be gained and much was to be risked by committing himself to the offensive with only part of his forces. No. I am not prepared to bring on a general engagement today, Longstreet is not up. But the very gods of war seemed to wear grey that hot afternoon. Rhodes had not been long in action when smoke began to rise still farther to the eastward and guns from that quarter added their roar. Early's division of Ewell's corps had arrived on Rhodes's left and was driving the Federals who had been threatening Dole's flank. At precisely the right place, and at exactly the right moment, a third blow was being delivered. Everything was working perfectly. The hard-beset Federals formed a right angle now, their left running from south to north, and their right from west to east. Opposite their left was Haight, with two of his four brigades unscathed and with Pender's fresh division in reserve. At the angle in the line roads was hammering hard. On the Federal right, Early's veterans were thundering. With Pender it would be easy to outflank the Federal left, and with Early to turn their right. As quickly as the situation changed with the arrival of Early, Lee's decision was reversed. So fair an opportunity was not to be lost. The orders flashed quickly, let Haight go forward, 
bring up Pender at once. It was a miniature second Manassas. Before night Confederate independence might be closer to reality. The men in the ranks were as willing as their commander. With a rebel yell that echoed weirdly over the Pennsylvania hills, Haight's brigades swept eastward. Shifting their advance somewhat toward the right, Pender's troops moved across the ridge, joined with Haight, and charged irresistibly over Willoughby Run. Rhodes pressed on, early swept everything before him. In 45 minutes, the battle was over. The Federals were routed and had been hurled back toward the ridges south and east of Gettysburg. The town was in Early's hands. Nearly 5,000 bewildered prisoners were being herded on the field. Almost as many dead and wounded lay on the ground. A doubtful morning had ended in a smashing victory. The campaign of invasion could not have had a more auspicious opening. Riding hurriedly forward across Willoughby Run and up the next ridge, Lee halted near the point where the Chambersburg Turnpike comes down from the ridge. Here he had a closer view of the ground to which it was to be assumed the enemy would retreat. Half a mile away, at his feet, lay the town of Gettysburg. South of it was a high cleared hill that seemed to dominate a series of ridges that spread from it to the east and to the south. Toward this hill, in confused and demoralized masses, the defeated Federals were retreating. On the hill were blue infantry reserves and artillery. Some of Hill's guns were at once ordered up by Lee to open on these troops. If more than this could be done, if the ground could be seized at once and the Federals driven from it, the Confederates would control the whole position. Could this be accomplished without bringing on the general engagement that Lee was anxious to avoid until the entire army was up? Hill, who was unhappily sick, reported that the Federals had fought with unusual tenacity and that his own men were exhausted and disorganized. Prisoners had been taken from two Federal Corps, the I and the Eleven, and they stated that the whole Union army was moving on Gettysburg. Ewell, then, must undertake the advance. As Lee did not know the condition of Ewell's men or the strength of the hill from the northern approach, he did what he always did with his corps commanders in like circumstances, he issued discretionary orders. Sending Ewell an account of what he saw, he told him it was only necessary to push those people to get possession of the hill, and he suggested that Ewell do so, if practicable, without committing the whole army to battle. Soon after this message was sent by Major Walter H. Taylor, General Longstreet wrote up. General Lee pointed out to him the enemy's position, and while he was engaged with other military duties, Longstreet made a careful survey of the front with his field glasses. The two were, at the time, on a long hill, Seminary Ridge, that fell away to the east and then rose again to the road that led from Gettysburg to Emmitsburg. East of this road was rolling land parallel to Seminary Ridge and about three miles in length. At its southern end was an eminence of some 600 feet known as Round Top. Northeast of this, at a little distance, was a second hill, slightly lower, styled Little Round Top. At the northern end of the ridge was a high cleared position, on part of which was the burial ground of the town, which gave its name to the hill and to the ridge, an ominous name, faded soon to be all too apt, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge. From where Lee and Longstreet stood, they could see that the high ground continued eastward and southeastward from Cemetery Hill, reaching another height called Culp's Hill. The whole of the opposite ridge was, therefore, a fishhook with the shank running from south to north and with the point to the southeast. Round Top was at the end of the shank of the hook, the loop, so to speak, where the line might be joined. Cemetery Ridge was the shank, Cemetery Hill the beginning of the bend, and Culp's Hill the point. Gettysburg was directly north of the bend. It was a most formidable position, distant an average of about 1,400 yards from Seminary Ridge, which, in turn, afforded excellent ground for a defensive battle. Longstreet studied the terrain closely by side of the chief with whom there had not been a ripple of disagreement since they had entered Pennsylvania, but when Longstreet put down his glasses and turned to Lee, it was to assert his innate self-confidence and his faith in the plan he had formulated, ere he left Virginia, for offensive strategy and defensive tactics. Without waiting, apparently, for Lee to ask his opinion, he declared the field ideal for the course on which he had set his heart. All we have to do, he later quoted himself as saying in substance, is to throw our army around by their left, and we shall interpose between the Federal Army and Washington.
we can get a strong position and wait, and if they fail to attack us we shall have everything in condition to move back tomorrow night in the direction of Washington, selecting beforehand a good position into which we can put our troops to receive battle next day. Finding our object is Washington or that army, the Federals will be sure to attack us. When they attack, we shall beat them, as we proposed to do before we left Fredericksburg, and the probabilities are that the fruits of our success will be great. This was rather remarkable language for a subordinate to address to the commanding general, ten minutes after his arrival on the field of battle and when he had not been advised of the strength of the enemy. It was, moreover, a proposal that involved great risks. Meade presumably was moving from the direction of Washington, but how close he was and how fully concentrated, Lee did not know and could not ascertain in the absence of his cavalry. The Southern Army had been compelled to advance cautiously to Gettysburg and had been more than fortunate in finding and in driving the enemy there. To have led the army blindly around the Federal left would have been wildly rash. The surest hope of victory, the best defensive, was to attack the two corps immediately in front as soon as a sufficient force for the purpose could be brought up. To delay and to maneuver was to gamble with ruin. Lee therefore answered Longstreet at once, if the enemy is there, we must attack him. Longstreet retorted sharply, if he is there, it will be because he is anxious that we should attack him, a good reason, in my judgment, for not doing so. And he proceeded to argue his point. Lee said little more but displayed not the slightest intention of changing his plan of attacking the enemy at the earliest possible moment before the whole of the Army of the Potomac could be brought up. At some stage of the discussion, Colonel A. L. Long returned from a reconnaissance Lee had ordered him to make in front of Cemetery Hill. Long reported that the position seemed to be occupied in considerable force, with some troops behind a stone fence near the crest and with others on the reverse slope. An attack, he said, would be hazardous and doubtful of success. About the same time, Lt. James Powersmith arrived with a message from Ewell. He probably had passed Taylor as the latter was hurrying to the commander of the 2nd Corps with Lee's orders to take Cemetery Ridge if practicable. Ewell, said Smith, desired him to inform the commander that General Rhodes and General Early believed they could take Cemetery Hill if they were supported on the right and that it would be well if Lee occupied at once the higher ground in front of our right which seemed to command the Cemetery Hill. I suppose, Lee answered, this is the higher ground to which these gentlemen refer, and, pointing to the front, he handed Smith his field glasses. You will find that some of those people are there now. After Smith had looked, Lee went on. Our people are not yet up, and I have no troops with which to occupy this higher ground. Then he turned to Longstreet with a question that officer had not previously given him opportunity of asking, where on the road were the troops of the First Corps? But Longstreet was angry because his counsel had been rejected, and he was not disposed to be communicative. McClaws's division, he said, was about six miles away, but beyond that he was indefinite and noncommittal. Lee urged him to bring his corps up as rapidly as possible, and turning to Smith gave him this message to Ewell, Smith was to tell Ewell that Lee did not then have troops to support him on the right, but that Lee wished Ewell to take Cemetery Hill if it was possible. He added that he would ride over to see Ewell very shortly. Longstreet did not like this either. Although the troops about whose position he was so vague were those on whom Lee would naturally rely for an assault on the western flank of Cemetery Hill, Longstreet argued, then or before this time, that if Lee intended to attack, he should do so immediately. Lee explained again his reasons for not making the attack at once and expressed regret that the non-arrival of Imboden at Chambersburg had forced him to leave Pickett's division there. A general assault must wait until the arrival of at least McClaws's and Hood's divisions of the First Corps. Longstreet had no more to say, thinking that Lee might later change his mind and make no attack, and presently Old Pete rode off. It was now about 5.30 p.m. firing had ceased along the whole front. Major Taylor had returned and had reported the delivery of Lee's message to Ewell, but there was no sign of any effort on the part of Ewell to storm Cemetery Hill. To ascertain precisely the state of affairs on the front of the Second Corps, Lee rode over to Gettysburg and soon found Ewell and Rhodes together. In the arbor back of a little house north of the town on the Carlisle Road, he sat down with them to hear their reports. Their statements showed all too plainly that the new organization of the Second Corps was operating very clumsily. Two of Rhodes's brigade commanders had failed badly in the attack that Lee had witnessed.
Colonel Edward O'Neill of Alabama had stayed with his rear regiment while the other three had been almost useless in the fight. General Iverson had been misled by a foolish report that one of his regiments had raised the white flag and had gone over to the enemy. Rhodes had lost nearly 2,500 men and found himself, at the end of the action, on ground from which he did not believe he could advance directly on Cemetery Hill. Early had a better position, but after his first successful onslaught, his progress had been held up by panicky reports from an inexperienced brigadier that troops were advancing on the York Road against his left flank. Worse still, Ewell had been irresolute. He had been thrown off his balance, early in the day, by the receipt of discretionary instructions to march either on Gettysburg or on Cashtown, as circumstances might dictate. Accustomed to explicit orders, he had complained then of what he termed the ambiguity of Lee's directions and had for a time been undecided what to do. After he had reached Gettysburg, he had remained passive in the streets awaiting orders. So contrary was such a halt to the traditions of the fast-moving Second Corps that one of the staff officers of the dead Stonewall had said sorrowfully to his mates, Jackson is not here. Early had already established by his positive manner a singular domination over the mind of Ewell, and he had promptly urged that Hayes's brigade, which had an excellent position, should be allowed to advance at once and take Cemetery Hill, but Ewell had hesitated. The fiery Trimble, who had joined Ewell and was acting as a volunteer aide, had at length lost all patience and had pleaded, give me a division and I will engage to take that hill. When Ewell had declined, Trimble had said, give me a brigade and I will do it. Still Ewell had refused. Give me a good regiment, Trimble had cried, and I will engage to take that hill. After Ewell had again withheld consent, Trimble is alleged to have thrown down his sword and to have left Ewell, swearing you would not serve under such an officer. Ewell had explained to Early that he wished to wait until the arrival of Johnson's division before he attacked, but by his delay he had lost an opportunity of seizing easily the position on Cemetery Hill that was the key to victory. All this had been before 4 p.m. A little later, when Johnson had arrived half a mile north of Gettysburg, in rear of Rhodes's division, Ewell had inquired of Early where he thought Johnson should be placed. Early had advised that Johnson seize Culp's Hill at once, but Ewell had continued irresolute and had insisted on making a reconnaissance. False reports had continued to come in from straggling cavalrymen of enemy movements in rear of his left flank, Ewell had seemed at a loss as to what opinion to form. These provoking details, of course, were not related to Lee when he went into conference with Ewell and Rhodes, but it was manifest that Ewell had abandoned all intention of attacking that evening. Equally must it have been plain to Lee, despite his lack of close acquaintance with the man, that Ewell's new responsibilities had sapped his powers of decision. Soon early arrived, by Ewell's order, and the conversation turned to the operations of the next day. Can't you, with your corps, attack on this flank tomorrow? Lee asked. Ewell said nothing, Early took the floor. Anxious as he had been during the afternoon to engage the enemy, he argued now that the approaches were very difficult. The Federals, he said, would certainly concentrate in front of Ewell during the night, inasmuch as the divisions of the Second Corps were the only troops in close proximity to them. An attack, he contended, would be most costly and of doubtful issue. The ground was more favorable to an attack south of Gettysburg, early maintained, and if an offensive there resulted in the capture of the round tops, which he pointed out through the gathering dusk, the Confederates would dominate the entire field. Ewell and Rhodes acquiesced in this view. After some discussion, Lee inquired, then perhaps I had better draw you around towards our right, as the line will be very long and thin if you remain here, and the enemy may come down and break through? Again it was Early who answered, not Ewell, and it was pride, not tactics, that shaped his reply. He felt that his men had won a victory and that they would consider their success empty if they were ordered to give up the ground they had gained. Besides, he could not move his seriously wounded. Lee need not fear, he asserted, that the enemy would break through. The Second Corps could hold its own against any troops that might be sent down from the hills to attack it. Early did not think then or thereafter that his answer carried with it any implication of unwillingness to have Ewell's men do their part in the battle, but if the old commander of those troops, sleeping in his newly made grave at Lexington, had hurt Early, he would have risen wrathfully in the searments of death at the suggestion that the Second Corps could remain inactive when victory lay just over the crest of Cemetery Hill.
Li must have been disappointed at Early's answer and must have been puzzled to note a moment later that Yule, though he had been schooled under Jackson and had fought in the valley, contented himself with merely agreeing that Early was right. Li pondered their proposal, his head bent low. An attack on the right. Hill's core badly battered. Well, he said at length, more to himself than to them, if I attack from my right, Longstreet will have to make the attack. Then he raised his head, Longstreet is a very good fighter when he gets in position and gets everything ready, but he is so slow. Lee had expressed the same opinion of Longstreet to Custis and he voiced it privately after the war, but he probably would not have made such a statement in the presence of other officers if he had not been thrown off his guard by the perplexities that developed when first Longstreet and then the commanders of the 2nd Corps balked at an offensive, the chosen and tested tactical method of the Army of Northern Virginia. Early went on to explain that if an attack were made on the right, the 2nd Corps would follow up the success and destroy the enemy's right. Lee was not wholly convinced that the chiefs of the corps were correct in their stand, but, tentatively, he accepted their view and left them ere long, with the understanding that the attack was to be made on the right as early as practicable the next morning, and that the left wing was to press the enemy and pursue any advantage that might be gained. After Lee returned to Seminary Ridge and received the reports of reconnaissance made during the late afternoon, he became dissatisfied with the decision he had reached in council with Ewell and sought an opportunity of reviewing his whole problem. Anderson's division was now up, and Hill's corps was complete. So was Ewell's. Longstreet should be able to have McClaws's division on the ground by daylight, along with all Hood's, except Law's brigade, which would arrive from New Guilford during the forenoon. The time of the arrival of Pickett's division would depend on when Imboden reached Chambersburg. So much for the infantry. As for the cavalry, Jenkins's brigade was close at hand, and word had been received, at last. From Stuart. He was at Carlisle, whither messengers had been sent to hurry his march. He would not, however, be available until late on the 2D. Lee, therefore, would have about 50,000 infantry and some 2,000 of Jenkins's cavalry available early on the morning of July 2. All the reinforcements he could hope to receive thereafter, if he delayed the battle, would be Stuart's weary horse and about 7,000 infantry. If, then, he was to take the offensive, his first judgment expressed to Longstreet when they met on Seminary Ridge was confirmed, he must strike as soon as possible and before the whole of the Federal Army arrived on his front. But was it wise to attack at all? What alternatives were there? He could take Longstreet's advice and move around to the right, interposing his army between Meade and the approaches to Washington. Secondly, he could await attack where he was. Thirdly, he could retreat by the route on which he had advanced. As he had come through the passes west of Gettysburg, it will be remembered that Lee had admired their strength and had told Anderson that he could withdraw, if necessary, and defend the gorges. But now that he had nearly the whole of his army east of the mountains he realized that any attempt to evacuate his troops and his wagon train, in the face of a foe who had not been crippled by his blows, would be difficult and dangerous. He could not afford to await attack, living off the country, because the enemy could easily seize the gaps in the mountains and confine his foraging parties to a very narrow area. The only alternative to a direct attack before the enemy was fully concentrated was, therefore, to move to the right, turn the flank of Meade and get between him and Washington. But if this were undertaken at once, it would have to be done in the absence of the greater part of the cavalry. It would entail a wide-flanking march against an enemy of whose position he was still uncertain and could only learn through Jenkins's inexperienced troopers. Such a march, moreover, would necessitate a continuous concentration, with no chance of foraging for the army. If Lee considered such a move a second time, after having dismissed it in his conversation with Longstreet, he definitely abandoned it later in the day as impracticable, and in this decision he has since been sustained by nearly all military critics. Marshal McMahon attempted somewhat the same movement seven years later, without his cavalry, and came to Sedan. Strategically, then, Lee saw no alternative to attacking the enemy before Meade concentrated, much as he disliked to force a general engagement so early in the campaign and at such a distance from Virginia. Tactically, what was the best plan? Manifestly, Ewell was not disposed to undertake an assault on Cemetery Hill from the north. If Ewell, Early, and Rhodes were agreed that it could not be done, then manifestly it would not be done.
but an attack on the right, opposite Cemetery Ridge, to be followed up on the left, as tentatively agreed upon in conference with Ewell, was this the wisest course? Late reconnaissance reports did not discourage an attack on the right, but would Ewell be able to cooperate effectively? Or would the second course simply be left idle while the rest of the army fought? Lee's doubts increased on reflection. It seemed better to shorten the line, to concentrate heavily on the right and to throw the three corps against that position rather than to operate on a long exterior line. Having reached this conclusion, Lee sent a message to Ewell, telling him that the ground looked favorable on the right and that, if he could do nothing where he was, he should move during the night and reinforce that flank. In answer to this message, Ewell rode over late in the evening. He explained that two of his lieutenants had reconnoitred Culp's Hill at the point of the fishhook and had found it unoccupied by the enemy. If allowed to stay where he was, Ewell believed that Johnson could capture that eminence, which overlooked Cemetery Hill. This at once changed the outlook. For, obviously, if Ewell could take Culp's Hill and thereby keep the Federals from using Cemetery Hill for an enfilading fire on the troops that were to attack Cemetery Ridge, the Second Corp could be profitably employed where it was. Lee therefore cancelled the orders for Ewell to move to the right and directed him to take Culp's Hill as soon as practicable. Longstreet was with Lee during the evening while this change in plan was being matured. Lee gave him no positive order to attack at any particular point the next morning, yet Longstreet must have known that Lee wished the First Corps brought up as rapidly as possible. He must have understood, also, that Lee intended to attack as soon as it arrived, in the hope of driving the Federals from their position before the whole of the Army of the Potomac was concentrated in his front. In dealing with Longstreet, as with Jackson until his death, it was not Lee's custom to give explicit orders on the field of battle, he had been content to outline his plan and to express his wishes in the belief that his corps commanders would arrange the details more accurately than he would be able to do. He simply followed his established practice when he refrained on the night of July 1 from giving Longstreet direct orders to have his men at the front by a given hour. It never occurred to him that Longstreet would make his commander's usual deference an excuse for delaying a movement he disapproved. The plan was discussed at Lee's headquarters and seemed to be fully understood. As Longstreet had to bring up his troops and deliver the major blow, whereas Ewell's men were already at hand for their lesser part in the enterprise, Lee decided to time Ewell's movements by Longstreet's. Toward midnight, a courier went off with orders to Ewell not to attack until he heard Longstreet's guns open. Gentlemen, said Lee to some of his weary officers, by way of final announcement, we will attack the enemy as early in the morning as practicable. Then, under a pale moon that gave a weird light to the field, Lee retired to a small house east of Seminary Ridge and just north of the Chambersburg Pike for a few hours' rest. In the nearby orchard his staff made their bivouac. On the ridges about headquarters and in the fields outside the anxious town, most of the Confederate soldiers were already asleep. To the westward, Hood and McClaws had halted their weary columns. From the south, Federal Corps were marching fast over shadowed roads. Groaning wagon trains were bringing up shell and food for the Army of the Potomac. But the issue did not depend solely on valor, strategy, tactics, logistics, and the weight of numbers. Half determined already, by Ewell's irresolution, the battle was being decided at that very hour in the mind of Longstreet, who at his camp, a few miles away, was eating his heart away in sullen resentment that Lee had rejected his long-cherished plan of a strategic offensive and a tactical defensive. Chapter 7 What Can Detain Longstreet? Lee was up and at breakfast before daylight on July 2, and soon he had his officers scurrying off to make reconnaissance for the attack. Captain Samuel R. Johnston of the Engineers was sent at four o'clock to examine the ground over which the assault was to be made. Colonel Long and General Pendleton were directed to see that the artillery was well placed. Then Lee rode out to a post of observation on Seminary Ridge to answer for himself the question on which the probability of defeat or success hung, the question of how heavily the Federals had reinforced their troops on Cemetery Ridge during the night. Eagerly Lee put his glasses to his eyes and studied in the growing light the long hillside in front of him. He could not have asked for a better prospect than that which greeted him. The Federals were still on Cemetery Hill, but so far as he could see, nearly all the ridge south of the hill was bare. The two corps that had been defeated the previous afternoon had not yet been strengthened. 
Ewell had intercepted a message during the night showing that Sykes's V Corps had been four miles east of Gettysburg at 12.30 a.m. and was to march at 4 o'clock. As this dispatch had been addressed to Major General H. W. Slocum, commanding the 12 Corps, it was to be assumed that Slocum's men were close at hand also. But neither Corps was up yet, and if Longstreet was ready to attack, the ridge could be taken and the remnant of the I and 11 Corps destroyed. Lee turned and looked for Longstreet's veterans, who, by this time, should be shaping their gray lines along the slope from which they were to advance. But they were not there, not a man of them. Although their commander had been ordered the previous afternoon to hasten his march, when one division was then only about six miles away, there was not a sign of the approach of the leading brigade. Was the opportunity to be lost because of Longstreet's slowness? Would the V and 12 Corps reach Cemetery Ridge before McClaws and had arrived opposite them? What could be done? Could Ewell attack meantime, and if not, would it be wise to revert to the plan formulated and rejected the previous day, and to bring the 2nd Corps to the right, in case Longstreet delayed so long that the full strength of the army would be required to drive from the heights the Federals who would soon occupy them? Feeling that the golden minutes were slipping through his fingers, Lee hurried Major Venable off to Ewell to inquire what his prospects were, and to tell him that the question was whether all the troops should be transferred to the right. Soon after Venable had ridden off, General Longstreet arrived on the ridge. The head of his column was not far behind, but the start had been most leisurely and the two divisions were spread out for a long distance on the Chambersburg Road. Longstreet not only was late but was in a bad humor besides. As soon as he saw that the Federals were still in position on Cemetery Hill, he renewed his argument for a turning movement to get between the enemy and Washington. The fact that Lee had informed him the previous afternoon of his intention to attack Cemetery Ridge did not deter him from again insisting that his own plan was better. Lee listened courteously but continued unshaken in his belief that a battle had become in a measure inevitable and that an instant offensive might yield so decisive a victory as to justify the risks. As Longstreet argued and Lee waited for the arrival of McClaws and Hood, federal reinforcements began to file into position on Cemetery Ridge. Minute by minute their strength increased until it soon was apparent that instead of occupying the ridge without resistance, Lee had to reshape his plans so as to take it in the face of the enemy's opposition and with the least interference from Cemetery Hill. As he studied the terrain, he observed that there were two excellent positions on the Emmitsburg Road, which ran for part of its length on high ground between the two main ridges. One of these positions was directly west of Round Top and the other at a peach orchard on the farm of J. Want. Lee reasoned that if he extended his right until he was opposite Round Top, he would get beyond the federal left. Then, by advancing up the Emmitsburg Road, he could seize the peach orchard, plant his artillery there and cover an attack on that section of the ridge occupied by the foe. In this way, he would be able to escape an enfilade from the guns on Cemetery Hill for much of the distance of advance. If his move up the ridge did not drive the Federals from that position, he might have to make a frontal attack on the upper end of the ridge. This might be subject to enfilade from the hill, but if, meantime, he was astride the lower end of the ridge he would have an enfilade of his own against the left flank of the Federals who were opposing a direct attack from Seminary Ridge. If Ewell could advance and seize Cemetery Hill, he could stop all Federal flank fire. To ponder this plan, Lee left Longstreet and walked alone among the trees. As he paced back and forth, engrossed in his thoughts, still more Federals arrived on Cemetery Ridge and disappeared behind the fences that covered its sides. More eyes and more field glasses were fixed on them now, for numbers of Lee's officers were coming up to report. Hill was there. So was Haight, his head bound up from a wound received the previous day. The foreign observers were intent witnesses. Two of them were perched in a tree, studying the Federal position. Soon General Hood arrived, ahead of his troops, and sought out Lee. The enemy is here, Lee told him, and if we do not whip him, he will whip us. Hood interpreted this to mean that Lee was anxious to attack forthwith, but Longstreet, who must have overheard the remark, hastened to say privately to Hood, The General is a little nervous this morning, he wishes me to attack, I do not wish to do so without picket. I never like to go into battle with one boot off. This was an admission that Longstreet, in the face of Lee's known wishes, desired to delay the action indefinitely, for there was no certainty concerning the hour of Pickett's arrival.
At length, when General McClaws rode up to report his column nearby, Lee sent for him and explained his tactical plan of extending the Confederate right across the Emmitsburg Road, beyond the Federal left flank so that he could sweep up the ridge. General, he said, I wish you to place your division across this road, indicating the place on the map, and then pointing to it across open country. And I wish you to get there, if possible without being seen by the enemy. Can you do it? I know of nothing to prevent me, said McClaws, but I will take a party of skirmishers and go in advance and reconnoiter. Major Johnston of my staff, Lee continued, has been ordered to reconnoiter the ground, and I expect he is about ready. I will go with him, McClaws said. Longstreet, who had been stalking up and down, came up at this juncture and broke in, No, sir, he said to General McClaws, I do not wish you to leave your division. Pointing to the map, he said, I wish your division placed so. He apparently thought Lee intended a frontal assault on Cemetery Ridge, for he indicated a line in a direction perpendicular to that Lee had traced. No, General, said Lee, quietly, I wish a place just opposite. McClaws noticed that Longstreet was irritated and annoyed, but he did not presume to ask the reason. Instead, he repeated his request to reconnoiter with Johnston. Longstreet peremptorily refused. Lee said nothing further, and McClaws, somewhat bewildered, went off to put his division temporarily under cover. What was Lee to do in the face of such temper and antagonism? Had he been Jackson, he would of course have relieved Longstreet of command without further ado and would himself have directed the operations of the First Corps. But that was not Lee's method of dealing with his lieutenants. Never in his whole career did he order a general officer under arrest. It was his practice to make the best of their shortcomings, to reason with them when possible, and to appeal to their better impulses. In this instance, if he felt any resentment, he did not show it. Instead, he assumed that Longstreet would do his duty. He simply ignored the insubordination. And, indeed, had he been stirred by any other impulse, what could he have done with a battle imminent? He had no one to replace Longstreet. Already two of his three corps were under new commanders. Had Longstreet been relieved, the First Corps would have passed under the control of General McClaws, whose lack of dash at Salem Church was a warning of what might be expected if heavier responsibilities were placed on him. Costly as were Longstreet's delay and stubborn self-opinion, it was better to shove him into battle, knowing that he would fight well when actually engaged, than to risk the lives of 15,000 good troops under a less capable leader. Lee's handling of an awkward situation seemed justified by the immediate reaction. Soon after the colloquy, Colonel Alexander came up and reported that the artillery of the First Corps was arriving on Seminary Ridge. Longstreet at once gave him instructions, in Lee's hearing, to place the batteries where Lee wished them stationed. In the expectation that Longstreet would recover his balance and dispose his troops for an immediate attack, Lee now left him and rode over toward Gettysburg to see the situation on Ewell's front. Captain Justice Skybert, the Prussian observer, who had been with Lee at Chancellorsville and had noticed his quiet demeanor on that field, remarked after the war that, in the days at Gettysburg, this quiet self-possessed calmness was wanting. Lee, he said, was not at his ease, but was riding to and fro, frequently changing his position, making anxious inquiries here and there, and looking careworn. Longstreet also insisted that Lee lost the matchless equipoise that usually characterized him. There were those who disputed this and maintained that Lee was never quicker in his perception or clearer in his judgment. But if there was any relaxation in Lee's self-mastery, who could have wondered greatly at it in the remembrance of what he had encountered in the way of obstinacy, tardiness, and irresolution since he had reached Gettysburg? Something was amiss with the reorganized army, especially with the Corps Command, the most important part of the whole military mechanism. It must have been about nine o'clock when Lee reached Ewell's headquarters in the outskirts of Gettysburg. He found that Ewell was out reconnoitering his front with Colonel Venable, whom Lee had sent to him earlier in the morning. General Trimble was at hand, however, for he had not executed his threat to quit Ewell, and when Lee asked to be taken to some point from which he could get a good view of the enemy's position, Trimble conducted him to the cupola of the almshouse. Thence, as he looked, Lee could see that the Federals on Cemetery Hill had improved their ground greatly during the night. The enemy have the advantage of us in a short and inside line, he said to Trimble, and we are too much extended.
We did not or could not pursue our advantage of yesterday and now the enemy are in a good position. Descending from his lookout, he soon met Ewell and repeated to him what he had said to Trimble. As he encountered other officers, his language was the same. Trimble noticed how Lee kept repeating the words, we did not or could not pursue our advantage. It seemed to Trimble that Lee was expressing in this manner his regret that his first plan of crushing the advanced guard of the enemy had not been executed. More probably this was Lee's diplomatic manner of suggesting that, though the Second Corps had failed to do all that it might have done on the first, it must not fail in decision and coordination now. Lee found no change in Ewell's position, except that Johnson's division was in line of battle far to the left, opposite Culp's Hill. Nothing had happened to better the prospects of an attack on the left. Colonel Long, who came to Ewell's post in a short time, after having made a careful survey of the artillery positions from the center to the left, had discovered no opening. Lee was hoping that Longstreet would soon open the attack, and as the minutes passed in silence all along the front, he began to get restless. After a time he reiterated his orders to Ewell, the Second Corps was to make a demonstration when Longstreet attacked and was to assume the offensive if it found an opportunity. Then, visibly chafing at Longstreet's continued delay in advancing, he started back with Long toward the center in order to make a closer reconnaissance of Cemetery Ridge. When he reached a point where he could get something of a view of the high ground, he found that the enemy was rapidly strengthening his position and that the chances of a successful attack were fast slipping away. What can detain Longstreet, he exclaimed toward ten o'clock. He ought to be in position now. As Lee rode on toward Seminary Ridge, he came to one of the gun positions of Colonel R. Lindsay Walker, Chief of Artillery of the Third Corps. Observing Major W. T. Pogue with Walker, he reprimanded him sharply for not hurrying with his batteries to the right. When Pogue explained that he was attached to the Third Corps, not to the First, Lee apologized and asked eagerly, Do you know where General Longstreet is? Walker replied that he thought he knew where Longstreet was and offered to guide Lee. As we rode together, Walker has recorded, General Lee manifested more impatience than I ever saw him exhibit on any other occasion, seemed very much disappointed and worried that the attack had not opened earlier, and very anxious for Longstreet to attack at the very earliest possible moment. He even, for a little while, placed himself at the head of one of the brigades to hurry the column forward. When Lee at last located Longstreet, it was eleven o'clock or later. One glance was enough to show Lee he had been disappointed in his expectation that Longstreet would act to carry out his wishes. The commander of the First Corps had done nothing except to dispose his artillery and to deploy McClaws's division closer at hand. Although most of Longstreet's troops, by his order, had delayed their start until after sunrise, their march had been only four or five miles, and the last of them had now been at hand, or close in rear, for more than three hours. During all that time, the Federals had been visibly increasing in number on Cemetery Ridge. And Longstreet had been content to wait in the face of the known wishes of the commanding general that he attack as early as practicable. It was incredible, but it was the fact, and it left Lee no alternative to ordering the attack it was manifest Longstreet was endeavoring to delay. Lee therefore told Longstreet in plain terms what he wanted him to do and directed him to move against the enemy with the troops he then had on the field. Still assuming, despite the delay, that his positive orders would be carried out, Lee did not wait to see them executed, but rode off again to make a further reconnaissance, this time on the right, where a small federal column was reported to be holding a position in the woods near Anderson's front. Soon, however, he met General Pendleton and learned that the enemy had been driven out by Wilcox's brigade, which had extended its front and was ready to cooperate in the attack Longstreet was to make. By this time, noon had passed. Still seeing nothing of Longstreet's deployment, Lee turned his horse's head once more and sought Longstreet out. He found that the columns had at last begun to move to the right. The reason for this further delay, it developed, was that although Lee had specifically ordered Longstreet to move with the troops then on the field, that officer had seen fit to wait about 40 minutes for Law's brigade to come up. Longstreet's mood now changed, he was determined to carry out orders literally and thereby to put on the commanding general all the responsibility for the failure he anticipated. At the outset, when the march commenced, he remembered that Lee had told him Captain Johnston was to conduct the column to the right by a route which he had reconnoitered. If Johnston was to do it, let him do it. 
As I was relieved for the time from the march, Longstreet later wrote, unabashed, I rode near the middle of the line. Captain Johnston had received no orders from Longstreet and, of course, had been given none by Lee after he had been placed at the disposal of Longstreet. He only knew that he was expected to conduct the column by a concealed route, if possible, to the positions he had reconnoitered early in the morning. He set out, quite unconscious that the commander of the First Corps had temporarily delegated to him the leading of the troops who were to open the decisive attack in what might be the most important battle of the war. Lee rode with Longstreet, as he often did when he wished to hurry him along. The afternoon was now at its hottest, and the soldiers were suffering for lack of water, but now, as always, they wound their way cheerfully along the byways and over the fields. It was not theirs to know, such are the crimes of war, that some hundreds of them were to be slain needlessly before the fiery sun had set, because the peak of one man had thrown away the advantage that an early assault would have given them in wrestling with an adversary who was crowding the unseen ridge with his brigades. As they tramped along, an officer came up from the right and reported to Lee that the enemy was moving troops toward Round Top, the great natural bastion on the left of the Federal line. From the nearest high ground, Lee focused his glasses on that eminence, but soon lowered them. It was true, as reported, the enemy was extending his left. Ah, well, said Lee, that was to be expected. But General Meade might as well have saved himself the trouble, for we'll have it in our possession before night. The record of the army seemed to justify words that otherwise would have been boastful. About halfway down the front, at the lane leading into the farm of E. Pitzer, General Lee turned his horse to the left and bade farewell to Longstreet, into whose unwilling hands he committed the opening attack. Riding along the lane and through the woods, he joined Hill on the eastern edge of Seminary Ridge, opposite the Kadori House. Thence, north and south, he could survey the federal position. Save for the dispute of skirmishers and the occasional crack of a sharpshooter's rifle, it was, at first glance, as calm a scene as ever had met the gaze of a phlegmatic farmer who had paused on the hill to rest a complaining plough horse. But the landscape took on a sinister cast when field glasses searched it. There in Gettysburg, a mile and a half to the left, Rhodes's division was waiting. Along the ridge, the blue of federal uniforms blended into the green of the foliage, and the yawning barrel of many a field piece could be seen in the shade. Behind the stone fences was a constant stirring, vague but ominous. Directly south of Lee's position, the peach orchard was now crowded with something else besides trees. Still farther to the south, shimmering in the heat that radiated from jutting boulders, were the wooded heights of Round Top, still apparently deserted, in spite of the report that the Federals were occupying it. To the left of that eminence was Little Round Top, where the Federal signal station was working busily. How far the infantry line extended toward these towering positions, it was impossible to discern, but the occupied front was long and bristling, a very different sight from what it had been when Lee had observed it at dawn. It was two o'clock when McClaws's troops filed past Wilcox's brigade on the right of R. H. Anderson's division of the Third Corps. Soon Longstreet's men would be in position south of Hill, outflanking the extreme left of the Federal line, as Lee hoped. Then they were to attack astride the Emmitsburg Road. If their advance reached a point opposite Anderson's division, without driving the Federals, Hill understood that he was to attack frontally. As the battle swept northward on Hill's front, Ewell was to await a favorable opportunity and, if he found it, was to storm the sides of Cemetery Hill. It was a difficult plan and of such doubtful issue that there was small wonder that Lee's face took on an expression of painful anxiety. As Lee waited, Haight came up, to bear his commander company in the hour of contest, long remained at hand, Hill did not leave, the ubiquitous Colonel Fremantle was watching vigilantly, lest he lose a single scene of the pageant he had crossed the ocean to observe. Now Lee would watch round top through his glasses, now he would chat with Long or with Hill, but most of the time he sat alone on a stump, waiting and waiting for Longstreet to send his infantry forward. Soon the artillery opened, along a wide front, like the drums of a stirring overture to an opera that told of the struggle of demigods and heroes, and then, as if to remind the angry deities that human love and mortals' hope were stakes in the coming combat, a band in Rhodes's division, from a ravine on the left, began to play lively polkas and waltzes. But the drama did not open immediately. Some of the performers had been delayed once more in reaching the stage.
when the head of the First Corps was within a mile and a half of the ground where Hood's division finally deployed, Captain Johnston notified Longstreet that if the troops continued along the road, they would pass over the crest of a hill where their presence would be disclosed to the enemy. At the same time, Johnston pointed out a shorter, concealed route across a nearby field. But Longstreet insisted that Johnston go on. When the head of the column reached the top of the hill, whence the signal station on Little Round Top could be seen, Longstreet halted it and, after a conference with General McClaws, decided to countermarch and seek a better route. Hood, however, was so close on McClaws's rear that the two divisions overlapped and became confused when the attempt was made to retrace their steps. Much time was lost while Hood went on by one route and McClaws by another. Longstreet subsequently explained this curious incident by saying that he did not feel at liberty to interfere with McClaws's advance, as Lee had told him Johnston was to lead that column, but he considered himself free to move Hood, of whom Lee had said nothing. As the column approached its destination, Longstreet asked McClaws how he proposed to attack. McClaws replied that this would depend on what he found when he reached his position. There is nothing in your front, Longstreet answered. You will be entirely on the flank of the enemy. But no sooner was McClaws in sight of the ridge, about 3.30 o'clock, than he perceived that the Federal line extended far beyond his right. It was manifest then that in all the time that had elapsed after Lee had signified his intention of attacking on the right, Longstreet had done nothing to verify the reconnaissance made early in the morning. Because of the lack of information, the Confederate right had to be extended still farther and had had to be deployed beyond McClaws with his right flank directly opposite Round Top. All the while, Longstreet's apathy was so pronounced that even his own adjutant general subsequently confessed it. Soon had learned from scouts sent out by law that he could work his way around the southern end of Round Top and take it in flank and rear. Law insisted that this would be a far less costly line of advance than up the Emmitsburg Road, as Lee's orders contemplated. Hood agreed and sent back a messenger to acquaint Longstreet with the facts and to ask permission to turn round top. But Longstreet's strange mood hung over him. Willing as he had been during the morning to delay all action, in the hope of forcing Lee to adopt his strategy, he was stubborn now in adhering to the absolute letter of his instructions. Quickly he sent word back to Hood, General Lee's orders are to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. Right or wrong, it was Lee's battle, not his, and he did not propose to modify the commanding general's plan, no matter how the situation had changed. Again, Hood asked permission to flank round top and to avoid a costly struggle on its stony sides. Again Longstreet refused in the same words. A third time, Hood besought him to permit the easier move, a third time Longstreet refused and sent one of his staff officers to repeat Lee's orders. If Lee had been with us, Longstreet wrote, 30 years later, General Hood's messengers could have been referred to General Headquarters, but to delay and send messengers five miles in favor of a move that he had rejected would have been contumacious. He had forgotten, apparently, when he wrote, that he had left Lee opposite the Pitzer house, and that Lee was then less than two miles off, easily available. Of all this, of course, Lee knew nothing. During the whole afternoon, he received only one message and sent only one. He had no intimation of the difficulties Longstreet had encountered on the march or of the situation that Hood had found on the flank. His first assurance that the troops were in position came about four o'clock when Hood's right brigade, that of Law, went forward under a floating cloud of smoke. The troops were so far off that even with his glasses Lee probably could see little of their movements, though the speedy outburst of firing from the vicinity of Round Top showed that the Confederate right was clambering over the rocky shoulder of that eminence. The advance was difficult, but progress was steady. Soon, on the left of Law, Robertson's brigade became heavily engaged. As it pushed toward the rocky position known as Devil's Den, north of Round Top, G. T. Anderson and Benning threw the remaining units of the division in support. But instead of moving up the Emmitsburg Road, with their right flank on the ridge, as Lee had hoped, Hood's men were forced to fight their way directly toward the ridge and, where they could mount it, to turn to the left. It was desperate going, and the volume and direction of the fire showed they were encountering the stiffest resistance. By this time, from the northeast, there swelled the roar of Ewell's artillery. Evidently he had heard Longstreet's guns and was making the demonstration required by his orders, but of the effect of his cannonade Lee could tell nothing. No infantry fire was audible from that direction. 
On Lee's right, however, the battle was now drawing closer to him and was partially visible through the smoke. About 5.30 McClaws's right brigade, under Kershaw, advanced skillfully against a very difficult position in its front. Behind him, Semmes's brigade moved quickly. Then, on McClaws's left, Barksdale's Mississippians followed their leader across the field, his white hair streaming in the afternoon sun. Their charge was against the peach orchard, and their advance was made with a dash and precision that won the praise of soldiers who had witnessed some of the most desperate assaults of the war. Directly before them was a strong picket fence, the crossing of which was expected to cause the Mississippi troops much trouble, but the impact of their charge broke down the fence in an instant, and they were soon beyond it, working havoc among the red breech Suaves who had defended. A few minutes more and nearly everywhere Longstreet's men were gaining ground. Law's troops were over the shoulder of Round Top, fighting like demons around the foot of Little Round Top. Devil's Den was taken, Robertson and G. T. Anderson were hammering by the side of Law's weary Alabama soldiers. Back of the Rose House, half a mile northwest of Devil's Den, the resistance of the Federals was stubborn, and the Confederate line had not advanced more than about a quarter of a mile east of the Emmitsburg Road. At the Peach Orchard, Barksdale's men were in a fair way of driving the Federals out, despite heavy reinforcements and a wicked artillery fire. If the advantage was to be pursued, Hill must now take up the fight. As the general direction of the Emmitsburg Road is from the southwest to northeast, Hill's right division, that of R. H. Anderson, would have to cover a much greater distance than had been traversed by McClaws's division in reaching the road. The ground, moreover, was cleared and exposed to a sweeping artillery fire. On the highway, opposite Anderson, the Federals had an infantry force and some guns. East of the road, the ground dipped to a little ravine and then rose to Cemetery Ridge. The whole stretch from Anderson's position to the opposite ridge was 1,400 yards, all of it directly under Lee's eyes. But Anderson's fur brigades were chafing at the delay and ready for the attempt, though the afternoon sun was waning fast and the hour was now past six. At the word of command, the soldiers with whom Wilcox had so gallantly held the line at Salem Church two months before sprang to the charge, followed quickly on their left by Perry's brigade. They brushed aside the skirmish line, they reached the road, in a quick exchange of volleys, they drove the Federals back. Then down the slope they dashed to the ravine and, under a steadily increasing fire, began to mount the heights, only to be met by a new federal line, advancing to meet them. Here, for nearly half an hour, Wilcox's men met charge after charge, though separated on their right from McClaws. Perry's men, on Wilcox's left, fought with equal valor. Neither had any support, as Anderson's division had been deployed in a single line. While these two brigades of Hill's corps were fighting to hold their ground east of the Emmitsburg Road, Wright's Georgians moved forward on the left of Perry. Before he reached the road, which was defended by a small federal force. Wright observed that Posey's brigade, which was to cover his left, was not advancing. He halted his men and sent back word to Anderson, who assured him that Posey would follow. Wright thereupon ordered the advance to continue. His troops hurled back the Federals in the road, crashed through their main line, captured a number of guns, and then almost without a pause, dashed up the ridge. While Lee looked on with admiring eye, they reached the crest and found themselves among the Federals' massed artillery. Firing fast, they forced the Federals from the high ground, which was narrow at this point, and drove them down into the gorge to the east. The grip of the Federals on the ridge was now broken. If Wright could get support enough to extend the position he had so gallantly captured, the day would be won. It was not to be. Perry's brigade had given ground on the right, on the left, Posey had not succeeded in reaching the road. Soon Wright found the Federals massing heavily for a counterattack, and he had to make his way back from the ridge as best he could, with heavy losses. Wilcox was forced to retire about the same time. The valor of the attacking brigades had been above reproach, but the divisional command had been negligent, orders had been confused, and Mahone's brigade had not stirred. Had Ewell been able to achieve more? Lee had heard nothing from him during the afternoon. The artillery fire from that quarter had diminished after six o'clock, and in the din of the action it had been impossible to tell whether the infantry of the Second Corps had been engaged. Just before darkness fell on the field, Rhodes's men deployed west of Gettysburg and moved to the southeast, but they halted and ere long withdrew.
Lee did not know that this was the last phase of a tragedy in faulty coordination. At six o'clock, when the Confederate artillery had been almost silenced by the overpowering Union guns, Ewell had ordered Johnson's division forward against Culp's Hill. The sun set before the troops began to climb the steep incline from the crest of which the Federals awaited their attack, but Johnson's advance was steady, despite the tangle on the hillside. As Johnson fought his way upward, Early threw two brigades into action against East Cemetery Hill. Their attack was furious, and as the distance they had to cover was short, they were soon within the Federal lines. But here, as with Wilcox and Wright, when they looked about for support, Early's men found none. Rhodes's division, which was expected to join in the attack, moving on the right of Early, had been slow in deploying and had more ground to cover. Once the column was stopped, while a report was sent to the division commander. Rhodes himself was concerned because he had no assurance of support on his right. When at length he was in position to attack, Early was giving ground. The whole of the three days battle produced no more tragic might have been than the twilight engagement on the Confederate left. For Early's right regiment had been within 400 feet of the flank of the Federal batteries commanding the approaches to the hill from Rhodes's right. Had Rhodes's 5,000 men been at hand to support Early for even an hour, the Federal guns could have been captured and turned on the enemy. Cemetery Hill would have been cleared, and the ridge to the south could have been so enfiladed that the Federals would have been compelled to evacuate it. As it was, Early's men fell back in bitterness of heart, Rhodes took an intermediate position. On the whole left wing of the Army Stewart's brigade of Johnson's division alone held the position it had stormed, and that command occupied only some rude trenches that had been abandoned by the enemy. It was now night, sultry and oppressive, and the moon had risen above the grim ridge the Confederates had attacked. The skirmishers kept up an intermittent fire, but the hot guns of the weary artillerists were silent at last. The dead and wounded covered the ground, many of them where burial or succor could not be given. The casualties among the general officers had been high. Hood had been wounded in the arm, Pender had been very seriously injured by a shell and was doomed to die. Barksdale had been killed in the brilliant charge of his brigade, Semmes had received mortal hurt, Colonel Isaac C. Avery, who had been leading Hoke's brigade of Early's division, had been killed, J. M. Jones and G. T. Anderson had received lesser wounds. On Cemetery Ridge, the Federals believed that Longstreet himself had been slain and that his body was within their lines. The whole affair, Colonel Walter Taylor wrote subsequently, was disjointed. There was an utter absence of accord in the movements of the several commands. It was a failure, yet not altogether a failure, and not a failure that reflected on the valor of the men in the ranks. They, at least, had done their full part, however much their leaders had erred. In the face of the most stubborn resistance the Army of the Potomac as a whole had ever offered, Hood's men had achieved the seemingly impossible in taking Devil's Den and in threatening Little Round Top, Wright and Wilcox had reached the main federal positions and Early had been within sight of victory. Troops that had achieved this much, despite Longstreet's delay and Ewell's failure to coordinate his attacks, could be counted on to do still more if the whole strength of the army could be employed the next day. Lee's confidence in his men, at the end of the second day, was as great as it had ever been. Then, too, favorable ground had been gained. The right seemed well anchored. Stuart's gains on the left might be enlarged. Above all, the peach orchard was in southern hands and, as Lee saw it, could be utilized to cover an assault on the position that Wright had shown was not impregnable. Enough troops were at hand for a supreme effort on the morning of the 3d. Pickett's division had arrived within striking distance during the afternoon and its commander had been told by Lee to rest his men for the morrow. Johnson's division was comparatively fresh, so was Pender's, Smith's brigade of Early's division, and Mahone and Posey of the Third Corps had not suffered heavily. Imboden's cavalry was in support. And Stuart, the wandering, much missed Stuart, whose absence had caused so much embarrassment, had arrived on the left, with two of his brigades, before sunset. Two more brigades of cavalry would be up before daybreak. Jenkins, also, would be available again. The casualties of July 1 and 2 would thus be made good, temporarily, by reinforcements. 
for these reasons, because the morale of the army was still superb, because much ground had been taken, because admirable artillery positions had been won, and because reinforcements had arrived, Lee determined to renew the battle on the third day. He ordered the artillery made ready to open all along the line as early as possible to cover the advance, and he directed Ewell to renew his attack at daylight. Longstreet did not ride to Lee's headquarters to report, contrary to his custom, but, still sulking, contented himself with sending a verbal account of what had happened on his front. Lee replied with orders for Longstreet to attack the next morning. That assault would be decisive, either Meade would be beaten and the road to Baltimore and Philadelphia would be opened, or…